Gurudev Commissioners. Good morning. Today we continue the two weeks of hearings on these priority areas of child protection and criminal justice. We will be hearing from Aboriginal community controlled organisations and service provider, providers as we did yesterday. Um, but before we begin, I would like to ask Commissioner Hunter to do the welcome to country. So I acknowledge and welcome you to the lands of the Wurundjeri and pay my respects to all ancestors and all, el all elders. I acknowledge those that come before us so we can be here today and have voice. May Bonjour watch over us as we conduct Aboriginal business. Uh, woman Jekka, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hunter. Appearances, please, Councillor. Fitzgerald, uh, Council Assisting. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Caffarella on behalf of the State of Victoria. Thank you, Council. Commissioners, I will now call Auntie Glenis Watts. Auntie, can you tell the Commissioners your name, your mob and where you live? My name is Glenis Watts and I'm the daughter of Rita and Tom Watkins, granddaughter of Gwendoline and Les Hudson, who was the daughter of Percy and Lucy Pepper. Lucy was the daughter of William and Lillian Thor, and they were Tatalong, Rabalong, and lived in the areas around Bensdale. Percy Pepper's parents were Louisa from Bratongalong and Nathaniel Pepper, who was Wajabali. Louisa's mother was Mariquan from the Bratongalong, and that was around Port Albert and Wilson's Prom area of Gippsland. And I currently reside in Gippsland, just out of Bensdale. So I've come down for the day. And thank you for inviting me to do this submission to the commissioners. Uh, Auntie, will you repeat the truth declaration after me? Yes, I will. I, Glenis Watts. I, Glenis Watts. Will provide truthful evidence. Will provide truthful evidence. To the Uruk Justice Commission today. To the Uruk Justice Commission today. Thank you. Uh, you've prepared an outline of evidence which you completed yesterday afternoon. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. Uh, and you've also provided your rook with a copy of two books that were prepared about your ancestors that you will speak about, materials that were produced from a travelling exhibition, four videos and an audio of a radio program. All of those things will also go into evidence. Uh, and I will tender them all now, Commissioners, uh, because we're going to hear some of that evidence during Auntie Glenys's appearance here today. Uh, I tender Exhibit 2.1 and following. Uh, Auntie, uh, you've, um, you've introduced yourself insofar as you've indicated uh, who, you, who your mob are, who you come from. Will you... Um, introduce yourself uh, and tell us about the current positions that you hold uh, and also about the job you've just recently left with the Aboriginal Engagement Unit of DHHS or DFFH. So I am currently a member of three um, minister appointed boards. The Gunai Kurnai Traditional Owner Land Management Board and I'm the chairperson of that. The chairperson of the Gippsland Lakes Coordinating Committee and I'm on the East Gippsland CMA board as well. I'm on the board of Glarwack and on the Elders Council of Glarwack as well. So, and um, I did work for um, East, or the Department of Human Services for about seven years and that was up until August 2022 this year. And it was in the Delta, an Aboriginal-led strategy to address family violence and based in that Aboriginal um, engagement unit. Thank you. Now, Auntie, if you will um, tell us a bit about your ancestors. Firstly, about your great-great-great-grandmother, uh, Merkawan, and then about the Peppers. And um, it would also be really useful to know how you found all of this information about your journey of finding out about them? 
So my great-great-grandparents lived through the white settlement of Gippsland, the massacres of Aboriginal people, the rounding up like cattle and being put onto missions, then removed through the Half-Caste Assimilation Act of 1886 and the government policies and procedures of the day. All of these things happen to children and I believe it is still happening today. The policies and removals are still happening. All of this I will talk about as evidence um, from my great-grandparents and from family. And I have got the books, like you mentioned, which was the Footprints books that Mum and I worked with the prof on, which is the um, Archives of Victoria, and You Are What You Make Yourself to Be, which was Uncle Philip Pepper's book, and that was my grandmother's brother. I've also got another photo there, which is Lucy's family, Lucy Thorpe, and it starts off with William Thorpe, Lucy Thorpe, my grandmother Gwendoline, my mum, myself, my children and my grandchildren. And that breath of life, mum always said, goes on because it's passed down from generation to generation. And Auntie, um, could we, uh, just so that the commissioners know the characters in the, the story you're about to tell, um, if, if the commissioners could be shown yep. um, that and perhaps j just... Um, step through again um, <coughs> who everyone is across the top, if you can remember it from, from memory. So it starts off with William Thorpe and he's sitting there with a boomerang in his hand. The next one is my great-grandmother, who is Lucy, and her daughter is Gwendoline. So she's in that small photo. The next one is my mum and myself. So, and then it goes on to my son and two daughters and my great-grandchildren who are sitting on mum's knees. I've actually got another two since then as well. But um, like I said, the breath of life goes on and it's all around Gippsland. So. Thank you, Auntie. I'll, I'll return that to you at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the oh, hearing. That's fine. Um, now, uh, can you tell us a bit about um, uh, ha what you found out about those, um, your old, oldest known relatives, um, her life uh, and the children that she had? So Granny Louisa, her journey started when the so-called big hunts were on for Aboriginal people. Her mother, Meriquam, was raped and that was where the colour changed, apparently, according to her grandson, Philip Pepper, in his book, You Are What You Make Yourself to Be. Maraquan was from Port Albert, Wilson's Prom in Gippsland, and Louise travelled up, her and Louise travelled up and down the coast. When they were at Yarram, when the, Louisa, was when Louisa actually lost her mum, she was killed by squatters, and they both had pallets in them. Louisa still had pallets in her when she died. She was then taken in by a doctor, Dr Arbuckle, and she took on his last name. She started to want to look for her own people, so she ended up being put onto Ramiak Mission in Gippsland. Ramiak Mission was start, established in 1862 by Hagenor, who was a reverend at the time. He'd come down from Ebenezer. And that site was going to be in Mafra, it was one of three Aboriginal missions established by the Mahoven missionaries in Victoria. The local farming community opposed the mission being built in that location, so it was moved to near the Avon River near Lake Wellington in Sale. That was where Granny Louisa met and married Nathaniel Pepper from the Wajabolic tribe of the Wimmera region because he'd come down to actually follow Hagenor from Ebenezer. The couple had four children, and one of them being my grandfather, Percy Pepper, or great-grandfather. Granny Louisa and Nathaniel Pepper lived on Ramiak Mission. While Nathaniel helped preach the Bible at Ramiak, Louisa was in charge of the Ramiak Orphanage. She was known as the keeper of the Gunai language, was a 
and childcare worker for many years. She acted as a nurse and midwife as well for the Gippsland Aboriginal community. She played an important role in holding together family and cultural traditions, especially when this cultural knowledge and language was not allowed to be practised on the mission. Granny nursed Nathaniel in bad health until his death in around 1877. At some time after Nathaniel's death, Louisa married John Jack Conley and hence she became Louisa Pepper Conley and known as Granny Conley. She had another four children while still at Ramiac. Granny Louisa also remained in charge of the orphanage which at times housed up to 20 children as consumption was taking over, uh, taking a toll on Gunai Kurnai people and other Aboriginal people. So in 1886, the government assimilation policy, better known as the Victorian Half-Caste Act, 1886, had come into effect. It was the act to provide for the protection and management of Aboriginal natives of Victoria. Granny Louise's family were caught up in this act. In 1889, her youngest son, Percy Pepper, was removed from her and the family, was he was sent to an orphanage in Brighton. He was about 11 at the time. And Auntie, um, just to clarify this timing, at the, at the exact same time that Granny Louisa Connolly, Percy Pepper's mum, was running an orphanage, her own child is removed from her to be taken to an orphanage somewhere else. That's right. He was put into a white orphanage which was in um, Brighton. Yeah. And it must have been devastating for her to actually have that happen um, instead of her being in her care. And especially she had to sign documents to say that he was orphaned or something to that effect, but he wasn't orphaned. She was actually, she'd given birth to him. So that was pretty hard for us and the family to actually realise what had happened to him in all of that as well. So him being sent off, this was an arrangement in order to educate um, Grandfather Percy Pepper and it was also to, intended to weaken um, the kinship ties that he had or what um, the family had. One year later, after Percy was removed, um, the rest of the family were exiled as well as mixed blood. And the Aboriginal Half-Caste Act of 1886 forced the rest of the family to move off Ramiak Mission to, into the town of Stratford. So Grandfather Percy was at the orphanage for around seven years my mum used to work for the Aboriginal community. She was working for um, bars at one, at Bell's bars at one stage and the Children's Hospital as an Aboriginal liaison officer. And she said they had to go and stay at that orphanage, well, stay there once for accommodation. And she said the place had so many bad spirits and vibes in the place that she couldn't stay there. And so... After that seven years of Percy being in the orphanage until August 1896, he was then sent to be an apprentice baker in Lake Boga near Swan Hill. He was there for about a year and someone from Gippsland had called in and told him that somebody had died back on country and he decided he was going to run away so he um, wanted to reunite with family. This period of time was most traumatic for Granny Louisa, Grandfather Jack, and Granny Louisa tried to keep helping other Aboriginal people. Her services were very much needed by the Ramiac um, residents and other people, so they were still bringing her back onto Ramiac to actually do things as well. Because she could speak the five Gunai clan languages, which helped the mainstream community as well, to communicate better with the Aboriginal people. 
as well as her knowledge of understanding the cultural and birthing practices and health and well-being of the community. By discussing and having her traditional cultural stories documented, which also included um, how to discipline young, the young, the waterhole near Seaspray, the massacres of Port Albert, stealing girls, Granny Louisa told stories of how men came and stole her and another young girl from their tribe's camp at Port Albert and about the Buen and how they actually found a white kangaroo would take them back home. She talked about the Buen man, who was the clever bloke of the tribe, and how they got him to sing in language and get the one who took the girls away they sang that bloke right back into the camp and how they would punish, punish him in Gunai law. All of Granny Lucy's stories have been documented in his, her grandson's book from Philip Pepper. And that's um, You Make Yourself to Be. Her descendants still have some of the Gunai languages and stories along with tribal life to pass down to the new generations. Granny Lu Louisa was recognised for her contribution to the Gippsland community in a time of adverse policies and the way government policies tried to destroy Aboriginal culture and families. So she was put into the Victorian Honour Roll in 2020. Granny Louisa has already been recognised in the following ways. A stone monument commemorating Louisa Pepper Conley has been placed in the main street of Bensdale, just outside Coles, in the middle nature strip. She's in the Encyclopedia of Aboriginal Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander History, Society and Culture, and also in the online Australian Women's Register. Granny Louise's legacy includes history of Aboriginal and European relations in Gippsland and particularly the effect of the policies on individuals, families and communities, reminiscence of traditional lifestyles and customs and life on Ramiak Mission. And we've been able to get some photos of her being on Ramiak Mission from different archives as well. So it's those because she was the keeper of languages and oral stories and they've been written down by Uncle Philip, it sort of has helped our family to actually be able to research more about her. I think it shows the resilience as well of family. So Lucy Thorpe um, then married Percy Pepper in Lake Tyres and they are my great-great-grandparents. So Mum and I did work with the um, PROV, and that was um, the footsteps, the journey of Lucy and Percy Pepper. And like um, Savannah said, um, we did a travelling exhibition and we did the three, um, three or four DVDs and we also did a podcast Ooh. with the ABC. The idea of that was so that we could get other Aboriginal people to find their stories in the archive because it does actually put the picture about how they were treated and exactly what was going on, especially when you read it in their own words because they're the ones writing the documents and they're writing to government asking permission for everything virtually. So they virtually were living in two worlds. They weren't, um, they were living on the outskirts of the two worlds. They weren't allowed to go back onto the mission and they weren't allowed to be, or they didn't really fit into white society. They weren't accepted all the time. And the Aboriginal community and their friends and families that were still on the, on like Lake Tyres in um, Lucy's sort of case, they had to get permission to actually go back on there all the time. And Auntie, um, will you describe um, the huge amount of material that you were able to obtain through the um, through Prof 
and that's the Public Records Office of Victoria. That's right. Um, can you describe the sort of um, material you obtained, um, the, the letters, who they're from, and the sorts of things that they talk about? The letters were actually asking the government. The government virtually controlled all aspects of their lives, and it is documented in that book. So the requests were about su supplies, they were cut off from the government, they were living in a tent, and Granny Lucy ended up with tuberculosis, a disease which affected the lungs, and had to ask government for handouts via letters. <coughs> Percy had showed a great lot of strength, um, trying to hold the family together, and through his kinship ties, which is a major part of our Gunai life, the fact that he, they were thrust into Western society and he'd been taken away. He got his family and he wanted to really keep that family together. And I think the government, when they were asking um, questions about rations and clothing and different things, it was always to the government secretaries. There was no leeway for human needs. So in those days, my grandfather also said it was far better to beg than to steal because he had to virtually ask for things because they were living in tents and everything else. Nothing was hidden in the letters. It was written as if it was written by them. And it was sad to read them signing some of the letters that they were half cast or your servant or oh, I'm so sorry to trouble you again. They were strong and proud, but the barriers were there to actually stop them from proceeding. Succeeding. Auntie, I might um, play a clip. One of the um, e exhibits in the tender bundle is an ABC radio program that was done about your family, and that would be clip seven. Um, and uh, it is, I think it's an, an actor who's reading out one yes. of the letters. That's right. Uh, and this is Away, and you're with me, Daniel Browning. Game, you know. Um, yeah, that was really hard. To the Premier, Mr Prendergast. I now am writing to you again to tell you I would sooner have all my family under the one roof and would like to be on the land if the board will allow me to carry on. This land was my great grandfather's and the white people took it. So why not? As I am the only half caste Australian Aboriginal that has tried on the land. I always work for my living and could do much harder work than I can do now before I went to the war. I have struggled and reared my family up to now, and just when they will be useful to the home, we are separated. The sale of this place is happening shortly. If you can see into the matter, sir, I'm trusting you will be successful. I remain your Percy Pepper. We always say we don't just have a, a family tree, we've got like a grapevine, because even <laughs> all of our family and extended family, we're all connected. Yeah, I think hearing Percy Pepper actually say that his land had been removed once before and different things, he was actually begging to try and keep the soldier settlement property that he was one of probably only five or six people in, in Australia, I think it was, that actually received a soldier settlement property and he'd signed up for World War One in 1917 where he actually went to... Fr had, did. Um, active duty in France and he received some head wounds which were called which were caused by shell blasts and so and he'd heard that Lucy wasn't very well back home so he wanted to actually go back home to look after her as well and when that happened I suppose to um, Granny Lucy was so sick She'd gone back onto Lake Tyre's mission to actually see family up there and she was told that she was allowed to actually stay 
on the mission, but the rest of the family weren't allowed to, so the government was controlling where they stayed and what they did. And so she stayed for a little bit and she decided that she would actually go back down to um, Kurirap, where the soldier settlement block was, and she they ended up carrying her out to a boat or a canoe of some sort onto by stretcher to actually send her back down to Kurirap. And it was during... She was only back there probably a month when she actually died. And it was during that time that Percy Pepper was arguing or asking for permission to actually keep his block of land when um, uh, writing all these letters to see if he could swap it for a better block. The block was actually known as the swamp at Kurirap, so it was swamp land. And so when you think about that, um, you know, we don't have the same rights as passing down or economic development that non-Indigenous people that got decent land, they have now passed their land over to families and generations where our generation didn't get that opportunity at all. It was removed, he'd built a house there and everything and I think he was only on the land for four years and the... Um, the place was underwater for three of those years. So he was um, trying to grow potatoes as well. So it was pretty low-quality swamp land. And I believe he was given this land because he was Aboriginal as well. And, Auntie, one of the things your witness statement talks about um, is the fact that um, community were not allowed to speak language, in particular on the missions. One of the clips uh, from... Uh, the uh, video material that your family has put together uh, shows um, BJ Cruz talking about um, uh, language. What what relative is he of yours? So BJ Cruz was Aunty Sarah's um, son, and Aunty Sarah was my grandmother's sister, and Lucy and Percy's daughter. So that's clip three. If we could play uh, clip three and, and we'll speak about language. Oh, oh land. And so when they come to Australia, they knew they'd have the same problem here in Australia. So they developed a program of de aboriginalisation assimilation. And um, under the de aboriginalisation program, they had different missions. They had missions for tribal Aboriginal people and missions for half caste Aboriginal people. And you weren't allowed to mix. And tribal people weren't allowed to speak any language to the young people. So they couldn't pass language down, they couldn't teach them no laws or no rules in a traditional way. And so um, they put Aboriginal Aboriginal people up and took them from their traditional lands and they put them on missions and they looked after them with handouts and, you know, blanket issues and things like that. The, the, the Aboriginal people um, living in that lifestyle um, forgot a lot of their language and a lot of language wasn't passed down. And I, I blame government for a lot of the problem within Aboriginal communities today because they could have took a different approach. They didn't need to go down a, a process of de-Aboriginalisation, assimilation. They could have learned from Aboriginal people. A lot of val um, valuable knowledge has been lost over the years because of government policy. And if they'd have worked closer with Aboriginal people and negotiated, then things would have been different today. Um, I, I don't know a lot about my great-grandparents, but all I know is that they lived at this place here and they weren't allowed to be buried here. It was on Lake Tyres where that was made. 
Mm-hmm. And in your witness statement, you talk a bit about your own personal memories uh, in the kitchen, remembering family dancing and singing, but then also remembering the shame that came sort of being, um, you know, enjoying those moments. But then um, could you tell the commissioners about that, your personal experience? Yeah, well, family used to get together and they'd be singing and dancing and even mum would be get the clapping sticks out and she'd be jumping around and doing little things and then they'd all start laughing or whatever and then they'd be, you know, shame job sort of thing because they weren't supposed to be doing anything like that back in those days. And um, uncles would even do a bit of dance and whatever as well. And I was saying to some of the Gippslanders the other day that some of the dancers that are in these old home videos, it was, you know, a bit different to how, you know, it was really (laughs) quite different to some of the ways they actually dance today. So, yeah, but it was. It was sort of downgrading that they weren't allowed to speak the language or to actually um, do their cultural activities as well, not outside of the house. So, yeah. Percy also um, tried to get... um, When Lucy died, she asked my grandmother and Annie Ellis to actually play a hymn on the organ at their house at Pakenham, at um, Koorirup. And while they were playing the hymn, she actually died. And he tried to get her buried back with her parents up at Lake Tyres, and that didn't happen either. They said no, because if she was buried up there, that meant that the whole family would want to go and visit her. And so they decided, no, she wasn't allowed to be buried back on Lake Tyres. So she was buried buried at Pakenham. And at Pakenham at the moment, there's my Lucy. um, Lucy is there, Gwendoline, my grandmother is there, my mum's there, my dad and my uncle. So it's like, that's like a little family. But mum always said she would love to have her taken back up to Lake Tyres because that was where her wish was. And I think there was lots of evidence in the Footprints book where different community people, even a white lady called Mrs Bond, actually asked for permission to try and get her um, buried up there, but the government of the day said no. I wanted to talk a little bit about about today and your the evidence that you can give about what's um, still going on today. Um, in your witness statement, you talk about ongoing racism in the child protection system. Um, could you uh, provi- just provide a bit of background for um, how you how you are aware of these things um, and how you've come into contact with the child protection system? And then um, there are some examples you give in your witness statement, which it would be great if you would speak to. Elaborate on. Um, so being placed in DHHS, we were in cubicles of four and... Four of us were sitting there, or three of us were from the engagement, Aboriginal engagement unit, and I was doing the Delta. And across from us, there was another two pods of four and one right beside us. So it was virtually this wall. This, if this was a wall, there was another desk beside me. And what happened is that the child protection workers would actually be talking amongst themselves across the room, either running down the Aboriginal community-controlled organisations that they were supposed to be taking, um, helping, because there was a mandate that they were supposed to take over Aboriginal children. And I just felt like it was um, lateral violence, that the way they were talking. Um, child protection... Um, were really rude. They'd talk about some children and they'd be talking to youth and I used to cringe at my desk thinking, you know, this isn't right. You've got to talk to them at least like human beings and have some respect and dignity when you're talking to them because they're already traumatised by being taken away and they were talking down to them. They didn't really... So in the end, I ended up putting in a complaint. Um, I thought it was 
really bad for them to be doing that sort of thing. Um, I put in a complaint to uh, management and my manager actually then got all of the child protection managers in so that they could talk about what was happening. Um, I did mention it to somebody else in the room in that office who was right up the front near reception and they said, yeah, we hear it all the time too, we think it's disgusting and they said that um, one of them said that she'd actually put in a complaint as well. So management did get the get us all the Aboriginal team coming in and when we were in there, I didn't have to say boo. One of the other girls, her father had been removed as a child as well and she actually let everything go and she just said, it makes me really feel sick because this is how they're treated. This must have happened to my father as well. And she felt really upset. And the guy that was in that pod as well, he said exactly the same. He said they just didn't know how to shut them up. And in the end, I started saying to them, will you please not talk over top of my pod because I'm working and you've got, you know, you should be being respectful to me as well. After that, COVID sort of hit and we were all told to work at home for two years or I was at home for two years. So I didn't really know whether anything had been put into practice. I know when I was in the office before COVID hit, um, one of the women walked past and said, oh, we're going to the union about this. And I said, all you have to do is be respectful and go into another room or else treat people like humans, I said to her in the end, because she was just, they were just horrible and there was a group of them. It wasn't just one or two, so. Auntie, I, I might play another clip, uh, um, which is clip six, um, because it's you speaking, but it also usefully introduces the next theme that I would like to touch on with you, which is how Aboriginal family structures and culture differs from mainstream white Australia. Um, so that's uh, clip six. This is family members sitting around putting together comments about the book. Lucy was talking about before when that family we don't just have a family tree we have a grapevine and even though Cheryl's my second cousin or you know it's like we're still family whereas a lot of families these days are just your immediate family but we still have our immediate family then we have the extended family and we have our cousins and extra cousins and mum's cousins and their kids are still our cousins so it goes on and if my nieces and nephews come down to um, stay with us, I take on that mother role as well. So I'm not only their auntie or a cousin, I'm their mother. So it's just part and partial of our Aboriginal culture. And you don't realise that that is part of our culture until when I married a non-Indigenous person that I realise that they have so many different things to what the way we do things. And you just take it for granted that, you know, everyone does the same, but they don't. Yeah. You get Aboriginal families, right? And like, um, they got their sisters or their brothers, they got their kids. They, we all live together. I, like, I've had 10 people live at my house all at once. Mm -hmm. That's why we were. It's like, the nurse's daughter, my granddaughter, when she was going to school at Mount Evelyn, and they uh, talked about Aboriginal people to her. And they said, you know, talking about Aboriginal. And she put her hand up, she said, I'm part Aboriginal. And they said, no, you're not. She said, I beg your pardon, I am Aboriginal. Mm. And they, the teacher defied her and she wasn't. In the end, she got up crying. She said, I'm going home to tell my mum. She said, she said, when I get older, I'm coming back to tell you off. She said, and bring certificates back to tell you I'm Aboriginal. Yeah, it was funny. Um, some of that and sitting around yarning with them because we didn't even realise. Cheryl and I, and because we'd actually asked, I'd asked one of those, just my age group, 
of those descendants to actually talk about the Footprints book, um, we thought, oh, we haven't heard about Grandfather Percy Pepper being removed. We better not tell people just in case it actually is, you know, you know, we don't know what they know, we don't want to upset people and things like that. But when we were sitting around that table, we realised that the aunties and mum and that all said, yes, it needs to be told, and they actually told us all about it as well. And it was funny, they were talking about even grandfather Percy Pepper when he was living in Fitzroy, going across to visit Hagenor, at, who was a minister somewhere local there, and they used, mum used to, they used to say, oh, he's going over to visit his relatives. And we always sort of, because they said that, we thought maybe there was German in us. So Cheryl and myself actually went and did a DNA test. We don't have German in us. So <laughs> that's why we know that what Uncle Philip had written in his book, that the white blood came in from other areas and, yeah, from the rape probably at the start. And that's what he said too. Auntie, I'd like to go back to this idea uh, that you were talking about um, in the video about um, just different ways that families operate in Aboriginal communities. And um, what's your experience of whether child protection have any understanding of, of the different ways that Aboriginal families and communities work? Um, and um, if you could speak about some of the examples that you've got in your witness statement. Yeah, I don't think that they do understand how we all link in and how we can actually work with each other and how we do take on the different roles. So, you know, I can be a sister and a cousin and aunt, a mother and whatever, but we do look after each other. And I, the same, I think we were talking about how the young kids will come home from school and, you know, they might eat wheat bix in the afternoon or whatever, rather... They eat when they're hungry. They don't eat when they're not, you know, when they have to eat. And so us doing things a bit differently makes a difference. The, the wheat bix example, is that something that you've seen a child protection worker be disapproving of, having wheat bix in the afternoon? That's it. I haven't seen them actually doing that, but it's like they things are, that we do are different and the same with, um, you know, even burials. I went to one of the women whose brother had actually died. He want, she rang me to see if I could help. And I said, I don't have anything to do with child protection. She wanted to know why her brother couldn't be taken. The children had been taken into um, child protection and into foster care and they weren't allowed to actually attend his funeral, and she wanted to know why. And I think it, from what she told me afterwards, their reasoning was really ridiculous. It was about, oh, they'll go to there, it'll be a drunken wake or something, and they'll all start fighting or something. And that just doesn't happen, all, you know, at our funerals. And I thought, how can they make assumptions and say things like that and deny those kids even going to their, you know, to their father's funeral. So that was really horrible as well. And I've had other families actually coming to me saying that they've rang um, child protection, they've wanted to talk to them and they're supposed to be giving evidence so they can get their children back and they've wanted some of their files or something and child protection, they'll ring the front desk. The front desk does not... They'll try and put them through, but they don't answer their calls and they don't ring them back. And so I would actually sit there and listen to them and some of them were, you know, it, when you when you lost your kids and you're trying to get them back, it's so sad to hear their stories of what they're trying to do and how they've, you know, changed, they've done this, they've done that. And it's really heart-wrenching listening to them. And child protection can't take five minutes to actually listen to them and even hear their stories. So I would listen to them, hear their stories. And when they've calmed down, I'll say, I'd actually say to them, look, I'll see what I can do. I'll try and get in contact with an Aboriginal liaison officer that works in that department. And 
It took them a while to actually get somebody to work up in Bensdale area. They had to go down an hour and a half down to Terrelgan to actually see an Abri Aboriginal liaison officer and every now and again she'd come up to Bensdale. So I got in contact with them and they said yes, they'd get in contact with them as well. So it was um, pretty downgrading to actually hear some of the stories that people would um, actually ring about. And then I had other families as well. One of the um, uh, issues that you raised in your witness statement is a lack of support for foster carers who are receiving kids who are really highly traumatised, um, which ends up meaning those those placements just don't work. Do, there were two of them, I think, in your statement. Did you want to speak to those? Yeah. Um, one of the families... This really upsets me because she's a nurse. She's an Aboriginal nurse. Her brother is an Aboriginal doctor. Um, and her husband is, um, you know, he's a really well-respected person as well up in Gippsland. And they decided that they'd foster three Aboriginal children and they were all from the one family. And she kept on saying to DHHS, these children are traumatised, they need psychologists, they need help. Um, can you please get us some help around what, you know, what we can put in place for these kids? And eventually um, nothing really happened. They did get some, I sort of talked to them about you could get some horse whispering through another agency, which was Community Health at La Trobe, um, La Trobe Health, and so they actually was able to get that as carers, but it was almost like it didn't matter what they put up to DHS on what their needs and issues were. So one day there she was taking the three kids with her own 18-year-old daughter. She only had one daughter, or they only had one daughter, and she was taking them to a barbecue at the park and um, she stopped because they didn't have any tomato sauce. So she went, ran into the shop, came back out and the 18-year-old was in the car with them and somebody had made a report. I'm not sure whether she said it was the police or whether DHS, someone from DHS had seen them and said that she'd left the kids unattended in the car, in a car. And so next minute they came in within a day or two, and uprooted the kids, took them away, took them off the parent, off, you know, the foster parents. And the foster parents were, he was so upset about it, he ended up having a mild stroke um, because it upset him so much that these kids that they were trying to help was removed. And um, it was almost like there was no... You know, they didn't do anything really to help the kids. I think they've said now that those kids are all living in all different places. They're not together or anything. So that was really annoying as well. And there's been other little things like that as well. I have um, a girlfriend that used to foster children. She had six of her own and they'd all grown up. And they um, were fostering all the way along when they did have their own six children and one of the kids told DHS that they'd been slapped by one someone, I don't know whether it was the father or someone, because they must have been mucking up. And anyway, they, um, they ended up going in and removing the kids that were there, and she was just absolutely devastated. She couldn't believe it because she said that she, she, that's all she did. She wanted to look after kids. She's younger than me. I think she may have just turned 60. I'm 66 at the moment. Um, and I thought that was her life, looking after kids, and she loved it so much. And yet she wasn't able to actually give those kids what she needed and everything else because they removed them. Um, do you want me to talk about some of the other ones? <laughs> Thanks, Andy. There was also... Um 
I think you you, uh, you have a connection, um, some knowledge about a teenager who was placed, and um, is it a, is it a him? Or it's a him. His behaviour was so hard to manage, and um, the care w- wasn't given any support there. That's right. Um, the person that was in our pod, he actually said he thought he'd like to. He was living on his own. He used to have his daughters come every fortnight and stay with him and he said he wouldn't mind fostering. Anyway, he got a call and the child, uh, they could give him a teenager, a male, and the young lad was actually put into his care virtually straight away without actually explaining what was wrong, what, it, what he'd gone through or what he needed or anything. And the young lad was traumatised as well because he'd been pushed from pillar to post. He actually um, threatened his kids as well, so the young boy did. And um, in the end, they had to send him back. But he said, if he said to us that if he had got the proper systems put in place before he took on this child or the young person, he said he told the boy that he would actually still mentor him and if he ever wanted someone to talk to, he was there for him. And I think he's still doing those sort of things today. Um, And the same thing happened with another manager who was Aboriginal at the department. He and his wife had fostered children as well. And he was just rang virtually one night and said, can you take a baby? So they were taking this baby off the mother then and there and the mother had been drug affected or whatever but the child also he thought was drug affected as well and that child he said we got virtually nothing with the child no medicine no nothing to actually support the baby and he said it was horrible the more they kept on complaining and saying something they still didn't get any history or anything so that was a real issue and a problem as well um, for them and for a manager to actually say that and they'd actually been fostering children as well. Um, it was They just don't seem to have any protocols in place in how they do that sort of thing or how they yeah, help families. And Auntie, earlier you were talking about um, lateral violence in the workplace. Um, as I understand it, that's not between your you and your other Aboriginal colleagues. It is, in fact, um, from... A whole, a whole different team where you were having to listen to Aboriginal them speaking about Aboriginal people in a, a, a way that you found very upsetting. Yeah, well, especially when you're having, you know, the organisations are there and they're serving a purpose for the community, especially our community controlled services that are down in Gippsland. We've got quite a few down there and they're all trying to do their best. And these people even though they're supposed to have gone through cultural awareness or doing whatever, would just put them down. And I'd think, how dare you? (laughs) I was really thinking they need to have some sort of system in place. I did actually go to an Aboriginal, I think it was a network meeting where they got Aboriginal people from around the state all together. And I did bring it up at one of their discussion points that these things are happening and what are they doing about it as well. So, because I felt like I'm only media, you know, down here and they're all up here. Because I think they need to start doing something about this. It's just not right. They talk down to people, they're talking about our organisations, and it's like there's just no respect there at all. And um, do you remember any of the things they're saying about your, the, I assume you mean the Aboriginal controlled organisations? Oh, they were just saying they're hopeless. They're, they're this, they're that. Oh, how how dare they take the kids from, you know, this point and put them over there and things like that. And I was just thinking, this is crazy. It's awful. And, um, and I ended up saying to the, the managers in the, a meeting, saying to them, isn't it your responsibility to actually get these people to work with them and actually support the Aboriginal community controlled? They're actually just putting more people on board to actually take on more responsibility in that child field or child protection um, field. But 
the processes are not in place for what the community, you know, what they're doing. And at the time these things were being said over the top of your cubicle um, in front of you, were those child protection work colleagues aware that you were an Aboriginal person? Of course they were. They knew that we were the... It's written in a big sign saying we're the Aboriginal engagement team. They knew that I worked for... Um, Delta as well because it's written everywhere and even through the Delta um, we would send people to the orange door the women would go there the first point of call was the child protection people they just you know they came back to me saying why did you send us there we're here trying to keep our family together and it doesn't matter if they're sleeping on someone's couch as long as they're with the kids, that was all they were concerned about and they were caring for the kids and keeping them safe. Even another family whose husband had been removed, he'd gone into jail, she was really scared about the father coming out of jail and there's nothing in place for them to actually get the, the father and the mother to talk as a mediator while they're in jail, while they're actually under protection. Because when they come out, the first thing they do is they go to the mother's house then they attack again or whatever and the children again are then subject to child protection. Uh, so just to, so I'm clear about that incident, while um, the father's in prison, no work's done to keep things are safe, but as soon as dad gets out, child protection goes to the house because he's now a problem. Yeah, he, threat. that's right. right. And that mother sort of did reports about those sort of things as well. And she ended up getting a lot of cameras put around the house and different things. So, Auntie, I don't have any more questions for you, but the commissioners may well have some questions. Mm -hmm. I'm astounded. Well, no, I'm not astounded, but I should be astounded. Um, that this disrespectful talk is going on in the workplace in a place that is supposed to be, who has all these mandates to try and keep Aboriginal families and children safe. Can you give us any idea of where you think some sort of inter intervention could be made to actually turn the department a bit more into something that, is, that, that isn't just um, reinforcing all the trauma that Aboriginal families have gone through since colonisation? I think they really need to start putting some money in um, pre-taking the children away. If they're working with a family or whatever, you know, that family sometimes hasn't got adequate housing and hasn't got, um, you know, the wage coming in, especially if they've been through family violence. They're usually separated from their partner or whatever, so they haven't got enough money. Some of the money that they are actually putting into foster caring and different things could be put into that family to actually get them working together. They could give them home help. They could, you know, give them food vouchers or something to actually help keep them together. I, I just think that there'd be a lot of different ways that they could do things without take, removal of the kids um, as well, I just think it's horrible the way they they act. Yeah, I think there needs to be a few steps in place beforehand. That. Ani, thank you so much for giving us your story. Like it's 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 um, an amazing story of the, the Peppers and your family. How long did it take to put all all of that together? Um, roughly, what roughly. the book? Well, just the whole history of you know, of knowing who who we are. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know bits and pieces all the way along, anyway. And Uncle Philip had put this book out in nineteen oh, eighties or something. Um, and you know, because we grew up with them as well. You know, we've got lots of home movies of Uncle Philip and all them mucking around up at New Morella and whatever. And we spent a lot of time when we went on holidays, actually, with family. We didn't go anywhere else. It's the same, like I was saying, my grandchildren, my children, their grandfather died. And I remember going to 
thinking, oh, well, we've got to get ready for a funeral. And then all of a sudden I get a message saying, no, there's no children at the funeral. And I sort of said, oh, that's a why, because we're part, you know, living and dying is part of how you heal as well. And so the kids weren't allowed to attend his funeral, but that's the way other cultures do things, I suppose, too. It's the same... um, I used to be a hairdresser when after I left school. My dad was a hairdresser and he changed his salon into a um, hairdressing for ladies on one side and men's on the other. And I had three people working for me, had a couple of Aboriginal apprentices. I used to go out to Warra College and cut hair out there because it was in Hillsville. And um, this client came in one day and she said, oh, isn't it lovely you've got a little Aboriginal woman helping you, dear? And I said, well, that little Aboriginal woman is my mother and she owns this shop, (laughs) like this to her. And it was like, okay, next time she comes in, we're too busy (laughs) for her. But these sort of things happen and people still do. They use these... I mean, we were waiting for a taxi out... I was waiting for a taxi out the front um, today, yesterday when I came up to meet Jamal and um, one of the lads was, had called the taxi for me and, um, and this taxi drove up, turned around and we thought, oh, he's coming back. That's good. That's our taxi. And it was the right taxi that he had rang. Then next minute he just turned the corner and zoomed off and he was yelling out to him to come back and stop and it was almost like, well, okay, maybe if I had been standing there on my own, because I, you know, I've got my dad's colouring, I might look like my mum, but I've got my dad's colouring. And my, you know, I thought, is that why that taxi didn't want to pick us up? Because I had another Aboriginal man standing beside me. Mm. You know, it still happens today. It's just horrible. Honey, can I, can I ask, I'm just going to ask you a straightforward question. Do you think the system's racist? Oh, definitely. Definitely. The bullying, these people, the way they talk back to... You know, they don't treat people like humans. The trauma that they must be must have been placing on these youth, you know, I would have hated to be in their shoes and have somebody talking down to me and telling me and dictating. And when I asked one of the families, well, how do you get on with VACA... They virtually said, oh, that's just another black, uh, a black organisation trying to be a DHS. And I said, I don't think so. I think they're there to help you. But they seem to think that the only thing they do is actually report them more to DHS. So I don't know. I don't... I tried to say to them, but they're an Aboriginal organisation that can be doing some right, you know, good things for you. But, yeah, they weren't really impressed there either. How does that uh, racism come out in relation to removing children? Does it come out uh, by Aboriginal families being judged by a different standard, a higher standard, or, or, or what? I think they've got a preconceived idea of Aboriginal families before they even go out there. I think they've already decided whether they're going out there because the person's... They don't look at the background of the person and why they're they're acting up or why they've got drug and alcohol problems or anything else. Why don't they actually put that family to keep your kids going to detox, you know, and then you know, we'll work with you to get through it. Half the time they can't even get into detox. I was on the board of Nguala Wollongbong for seven or eight years as well. And, you know, it was so hard to get people into detox. They could always go through um, rehab afterwards so that they could learn how to manage a household again. But getting them into detox, I think that would be a big thing too. But the racism is there because that's what they, yeah, the police going to different places as well. Now the police up in Bensdale, we've actually got a bit of a protocol with them that they will take the Aboriginal liaison officer or do some sort of work if they have to go out to family violence 
because the first thing that happens is DHS comes involved. They don't have anything like that at DHS either. You know, they'll just step in. Then they'll say, oh, well, what's your... Um, what tribe do you come from and all of that type of thing and, you know, oh, we'll put a plan in place. But it, these plans, I don't... I think... Sometimes I think they're gammon. They don't do a lot. Could, could I ask, is this mainly in a major town like Bairnsdale or is it dotted around other little towns, the way people are treated? Is there any difference at all? Well, the, some of the um, people that I was talking to, um, there was one that lived in, who was a grandmother that had children, grandchildren with her. She was up in Swan Hill Way. There's another one that that had her, um, the children that she was fostering taken off her she, and her husband is Aboriginal. She wasn't Aboriginal and she's in Yarra Glen. Um, the other ones were in Orbost. So I think it's scattered. I don't think it's just one area. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've just got one final question. So we, we've seen as we've, we've prepared for this and, and worked with... with the huge numbers of reports that have been written about child protection and the dramatic rates of removal. We've seen hundreds and hundreds of recommendations. Can, do you have any insight into why, despite report after report, recommendations after recommendations, there seems to be have nothing have, has changed mm -hmm. and, in fact, staff expressing these racist views do not feel that they that there is any, that they're not accountable. Mm. I can't speak why they don't think they're accountable, but I know I was at a Delta meeting once and the com Commissioner, Justin Muhammad, was there doing a report on the children. Um, and afterwards I said to him, so how many of those child protection children have committed suicide? How many of those children came from family violence, you know, and been removed because of family violence? They couldn't ask. They couldn't. He couldn't answer me. He said it, they didn't look into it in those ways. And I said, well, why aren't you? Because the suicide that's happening around the state is really bad as well. It, there's really high numbers, and I'd love to know how many of those parents that are suiciding or the young people that are suiciding is because of them being removed from their families. Um, there was one young girl, I can't say that it, she suicided because she'd had her children removed, but to me, you know, I just felt like that was a reason why, you know, she did, because she was struggling trying to get them back. Another young girl... Um, was struggling um, trying to get her children back as well and she'd actually worked with us on family violence to try and put a message out there that sister girls could help each other. You know, if you're in trouble, go and talk to someone and all of that, so we made a DVD around it. Um, but it's really hard for, you know, I think, yeah, I can't talk on behalf of what, where they're coming from. And that contempt is still normalised. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is normalised. I think they just have this preconcepted idea. The rest of the organisation, they're forever asking us to fill out questionnaires and different things about how you're feeling. And after working in there for six or seven years, I had probably six or six managers, I reckon. Mm. <laughs> they... They moved me from spot to spot to spot and eventually I said, oh, can I go into the Aboriginal engagement unit, you know? And it was still in the same office, but there's, there was no real system. And in the end, I'd say to my managers, well, I'm doing this job. If you want me to do something different, come and talk to me, but this is what I've got to do. <laughs> because I felt like I was reinventing the wheel all the time. And then you'd hear these little things going on on the side and community talk, 
community know what's going on and yeah, to help the community more, I thought I've got to say something and so that's why I ended up putting in the complaints that I did. But like I said, I still don't know whether anything was really done about it. Mm. I um, just have, I have one uh, question about um, the cultural plans. You said you think the plans are gammon and just for us non-Aboriginal people, and particularly in the audience, what do you mean by that? Well, I think that sometimes the department is supposed to look at the plans as well and make sure that the Aboriginal children are actually going to do different things. They might let them go and do um, NAIDOC week or something like that, or if there's a cultural event on, they'll go and do something around that. Um, it's supposed to... I would see it as an education for DHHS as well to say, well, this is where this family comes from or whatever. And having the right people to actually talk on behalf of country is really important as well for these children. So they learn about their um, ancestors and who their um, group is and who they're all about their country. I don't know, they would go to a co-op for that information rather than a traditional owner group where the traditional owner groups could actually add more meat to the bones sort of thing because it, yeah, it doesn't pat it out enough. Mm -hmm. And even when we used to do cross-cultural awareness, which was made compulsory mm -hmm. down there at Bensdale, they'd get the Koori Heritage Trust to come in. I think, oh, God. <laughs> no, oh, yeah, okay, that's a generic one that's going around the state, but it's, you need the meat and the bones put on, or the meat put on the bones from our area, not from someone coming out of town. Thank you, Auntie. One last question. Um, when you got a taxi yesterday, um, I think it was about 4.30 in the afternoon or 5, and I think you were there um, with Robbie? No, it was... Joey. Oh, with Joey. Do you remember the name of the taxi company that Joey had called? Oh, no, not really. But mm, Joey could tell you that because he <laughs> had it on his phone and he said, questions. I'll come with you to, mm. to ring them. But straight away you get that, you know how you get that feeling? Mm. And it's the feeling that makes you, yeah, feel bad. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for coming today, Auntie, and for the evidence you've given uh, and um, we will just have a very short break before the next witness now, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> 10, 15 minutes? Yes, I think 10. Um, 10 we have a pretty full morning. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the next witnesses are Muriel Bamblish, Auntie Muriel Bamblish and Sarah Gaffarini. Um, and uh, the witnesses, before I ask the witnesses to take the oath, we need an order, which I hope is on the table with you there. The order that we're seeking, pursuant to Section 26.1 of the Inquiries Act 2014, Victoria, having regard to the matters set out in sections 26 2b and e is as follows the case studies and case examples set out in the submission made by the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency dated 5 December 2022 not be published by Uruk the powerpoint presentation of the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency entitled Vaca Nudgel Community Protection Protecting Burais Launch Tended with Auntie Muriel. Just to speak up a little bit. Can you put the mic up so it can... Yeah, can we, can we amplify a little bit for me? Yep, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, pardon me, Auntie, I'm just going through yep. some housekeeping with the chair. Um, tended with Auntie Muriel Bamblett's evidence and dated August 2022, not be published by Uruk. Three, any oral evidence given by Auntie Muriel Bamblett at the public hearing in respect of the matters in one and two to the extent captured in a transcript or video recording not be published 
and four, a copy of this order is to be published on Europe's website with a website address given. Uh, and then there's a note to the order in relation to it being an indictable offence for a person, including a body corporate, to knowingly or recklessly contravene an order of a commissioner under section 26.1. So I seek an order in those terms, Chair. I make these orders in the terms sought, Council. Thank you. Um, Aunty Murrell, would you take an oath that, that is your preference? Uh, so would you, inserting your name, read the oath that's on the page in front of you, please? Yeah, I'm Muriel Bamblett, I swear, um, um, by Almighty God. Um, I'm just trying to work out which is in paragraph. Yes, sorry. That the evidence? Yeah, that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Auntie. And, and uh, Ms Gaffarini, would you also take an oath? Uh, I, Sarah Gaffarini, I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Um, before I go to the witnesses' um, uh, biographical details, Commission, we received a submission last night, a substantial submission, which I hope you have uh, available to you. Uh, that submission will be part of the exhibit. It's obviously a very comprehensive submission and uh, I've spoken with Auntie this morning about the intention, if we don't have time to get through all of it or in a sufficient detail um, to satisfy your inquiries, that we would seek to have Auntie come back and she's very happy with that course. So just turning to some biographical details, Auntie, can I ask you to in introduce yourself to the Commission? Yeah, hi, Commission. Um, my name is Muriel Bamblett, and I'm um, a Yorta Yorta, Jajarung, Tungarong, Bunarong, um, Barapa Barapa, and uh, with ties as well with Wiradjuri. And so um, I'm CEO of the Victorian Aboriginal Child Care Agency and um, also hold... Um, position on the First Peoples Assembly, I'm Chair of SNAKE and so have a number of positions that represent the rights of children. Can I be begin by warmly acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands that we're on today? Um, I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as the true owners of this wonderful land, their elders past, present and emerging. And can I um, also acknowledge you as commissioners and, and um, greatly respect the work that you're doing and hope that today that we can add some value to um, the, the work of the Commission in highlighting the injustices that have been perpetrated in the past, particularly against our Aboriginal children um, at the hands of both governments and community sector or NGOs or government, those church-based organisations that were there to protect the rights of our children. So, um, yeah, I hope that we've given a very full response and I know that we've been asked today um, about other areas and so we'll talk through those. But I thank you for the opportunity to be here and acknowledge thank you, thank you as you. Chair, Annie Eleanor, and the great work that you do. Thank you. You're very welcome and we're very pleased that you're here today. Thank you. Ms Gaffarini, can I ask you to introduce yourself as well, please? I'm Sarah Gaffarini. I'm a Butterwong woman of the Yuan Nation. Um, I am the director of the office of the CEO at VACA. Um, I too would like to acknowledge uh, that we are on um, unceded land today, the land of the Wurundjeri people, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and to you as well, to the commissioners um, and the important work that you do. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Aunty Muriel, can I start with you? Um, you mentioned your role chairing the Secretariat of the National Aboriginal and Islander Child Care. Um, uh, uh, that, that is the peak body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Child and Family Services in Australia. Nationally, yeah. And you were the chair of that body for about 10 years, from 1998 to 2008. Are you familiar with their most recent publication, the Family Matters Report 2022? Yeah, I'm, um, I was till 2008, and so um, three years ago took back up the position of chair, so I am the current chair of SNAKE, and so 
Um, yes, we launched the Family Matters Report um, two weeks ago in Canberra with Minister Murney and Bernie and a number of the Aboriginal senators. Uh, and that, just if I can divert for a moment, that um, Family Matters Report measures trends to turn the tide in over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care in Australia. Yeah, and it's it's embarrassing. The thirty-five, the numbers of uh, you know Aboriginal children significantly higher. And if you think about Victoria, um, when the Bringing Them Home report was launched, there were three hundred and seventy-nine children in out-of-home care when that report came out. Mick Dodson said at the time, if Australia doesn't do anything in 10 years' time, that number will double. Here we are in 2022, and that number is now 2,600. So um, it, it's significant over-representation, and Victoria's got the highest over-representation as per state or territory. Um, there is in the current report a state-by-state -state breakdown in relation to, or a snapshot, of the position in each uh, in each state, including Victoria, um, do those figures and those findings inform your submission that you've prepared for the commission? In, in part, but a lot of um, the figures that we put um, are actually figures that we get as well from Victoria, from the Department of Family Fairness and Housing. So we get regular reports every three months through the Aboriginal Children's Forum. Okay. Um, we may come back to that report as we go through your evidence. You also worked on the Northern Territory Child Protection Inquiry from 2009 to 2011, and you sit on a number of boards uh, and committees concerning children and the Aboriginal community generally, including Victorian Children's Council, the Commonwealth Redress Scheme Advisory Council, Social Services Task Force, Victorian Government Roadmap to Reform, Ministerial Advisory Group, Aboriginal Justice Forum and the Aboriginal Community Elders Service. Yeah, there's a few missing, but I think it's probably better not to go through them because I don't think we're going to have time to get through the whole list. A, pr a prodigious work effort, uh, if I may say so. Um, and uh, you also recently, this year, gave evidence to the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Reference Committee Inquiry on missing and murdered First Nations women and children. That's right. Uh, and is that uh, inquiry reported yet? Not yet, no. There's still um, still hearing evidence, and so um, a significant, obviously, inquiry, but um, VAC has given evidence to many inquiries across, so we've um, not long ago given evidence to the, North, the Tasmanian inquiry on, on child protection, so I, I think... Um, I think there's a lot of interest in what's happening in Victoria and what we're doing. Thank you for that. Um, you have been um, recognised with various awards for your contribution to the Victorian community, including um, appointment to the Order of Australia in 2014 uh, AM, the appointment adjunct professor in the School of Social Work and Social Policy at the La Trobe University Faculty of Health Services in 2009, the Victorian Honour Roll in 2011, and the Doctor of Letters and Social Work Honoris Cora from the University of Sydney um, uh, Causa in 2017. You're also a recipient of the Centenary of Federation Medal 2001 amongst your awards and recognitions. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think one of the early awards is um, the Vita Goldstone Award for, um, and I think that was in recognition of contributions to women's issues, so I think that's important. Um, but, you know, like the accolades really aren't for me, therefore, you know, our community, I think um, most Aboriginal people are, are conflicted about getting mainstream awards because um, at some stage you feel conflicted about a taking award, an award that sometimes um, embellishes or puts so many um, people up that have done injustices to Aboriginal people. And so I think many of our people, particularly the Australia Day Awards, it's really hard to be in a room um, sometimes with people that have done so much wrong to our people. So. Um. 
tell us about um, VACA and the work of VACA. Yeah, um, VACA was established over 40 years ago, obviously, um, by Annie Molly Dyer. Annie Molly Dyer um, was working at the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service, and so what was um, what Annie Molly Dyer was seeing in her work with, particularly with young people, the numbers of young people that were appearing before the courts that um, had a history of being in child protection, had a history of being placed away from their Aboriginal family, not knowing who they were, um, and coming to the legal service to help to ask them not only to represent them legally, but to also um, help them find their Aboriginal family. And so the numbers were significantly higher. And so Ani Molly at that time um, went as well to the Australian Adoption Conference and presented there about the issues. And so at this adoption conference, there was um, the Commonwealth Minister, um, Margaret Guilfoyle was there at that time. And so people like Pat Turner, who's now um, co-chair of the Coalition of Peak, but also Nacho chair, uh, CEO, um, actually put up a submission to start to begin to fund the Aboriginal child care agencies. And so back and a number of child care agencies across our nation were funded and, and that was the seeding funding to begin child welfare, a, a child for welfare footprint within Australia. In your submission at page five, you describe VACA as the lead Aboriginal child and family support organisation in Australia and the largest provider of Aboriginal family violence, justice support and homeless, homelessness services in Victoria. You note that we work holistically with children, young people, women, men and families to ensure they have the necessary supports to heal and thrive. We do this by advocating for the rights of children and providing everyone who walks through our doors with services premised on human rights, self-determination, cultural respect and safety. Um, and uh, you mentioned to me this morning that there was an aspect of the submission that you'd like to uh, develop further, given the opportunity, and to make a special supplementary submission about the impact of fa family violence on children. Yes, so I, I think, um, yeah, I'm particularly interested. But before I go into the evidence, I do want to read a statement. Can I read yes, the statement please, first? Please. Before I, yeah? Of course. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, I, I guess in making an opening statement, I do want to say that summing up 45 years of VACA's history of advocating for better outcomes for Aboriginal, ch and ch and ch Aboriginal children in Victoria and their families who have had contacts with the child protection and criminal justice systems, obviously for us, is an impossible one today. Um, and we hope that our submission, even though it is quite in extensive, um, that it's just the start of a conversation. Um, while this is the first official truth-telling process for Aboriginal Victorians, we have been asking governments to listen for in, to us for over 45 years. In this process today, I say that it's time to own the past. Thinking of the quote of Jack Nicholson in A Few Good Men, you can't handle the truth, and we all know how vitriolic he said that. The question for me today is, can Victoria handle the truth? The massacre sites in Victoria are well known, as are the history of government child removals. The truth I want to hear is what have government done or failed to do for Aboriginal Victorians knowing this history? After so many inquiries, reviews and commissions, what truth-telling do governments and their departments need to tell? What is in the hidden records? We know that the scalps of many of our Aboriginal people are in, par in Canberra. We know of the massacre sites. Every problem Aboriginal Victorians have today is a direct result of past policies, legislation and discriminatory practice. This is the past and the present. This commission, and I respectfully ask, needs to put a stop to the future continuation of this pattern. It's easy to say truth-telling is not just about government. Truth-telling means understanding that they did not and have not acted alone. We need to hold all those religious and private institutions accountable as well. They have profited and have been rewarded financially by government to assimilate us as Aboriginal people destroy our links to our culture, our language and our country. 
We raise in our submission for the, the need for Aboriginal Victorians to have human rights and for the right of Aboriginal people to self-determination to be recognised. This is our right. Aboriginal Victorians have always been activists. I'm proud to be here today to tell my truth, to tell Vaca's truth, and continue in the footsteps of those who have come before me. If we think about the child protection system, and if you look at the child protection system, you will see our ask. We need a distinct Aboriginal Children, Youth and Families Act, one that is properly funded and run by Aboriginal people. If we learn from what we know is true, government and mainstream providers can get close to the results that Aboriginal solutions can achieve. The Inside Policy Report of 2019 found that FACA, and this is really important, reunified families at 24%, and these are children on long-term orders, compared to 5% by government. Though that, um, that has improved to 12%, the department's rate, but still double the reunification rate. Imagine those 2,600 children if we had control of all of those children, almost 50% of those children would be going home. They would stay at home and they would stay safely. We have done much this work with less funding. Our submission shows that there's denying that Aboriginal lives are valued less than non-Indigenous children. The, manu the money values are there in black or white. Don't look at early help funding, it gets even worse. Aboriginal families don't get funded early help supports in Victoria. ACAs have to do this themselves. In Victoria, if you're an Aboriginal and want help, you have to wait until you enter the child protection system. This saddens me so much. So many families that have to rebuild because they, they, have to, they can't ask for help early. If you um, heard Glenna speaking this morning, she talked about family violence and as asked, we would want a further explanation of the impact of violence on children, on the developing brain. And all of these inquiries and recommendations say for women and children, but then all of the focus goes to women and perpetrators. So we need to see children. We have to look at the past to see the challenges we face today, the patterns of removal, disconnection from country. In Victoria, we have the descendants of so many of children. We have children from Northern Territory, Queensland, Tasmania, Aboriginal children. These children came, come into our care system. They were brought here on the premise that things would be better. Victorian Aboriginal people only make up a third of those children that we care for in out-of-home care. Isn't that telling you something? The other two thirds had grandparents, parents removed from their country. There were multi-generational um, removals. We have one, a number of children we support at VACA who are the sixth generation, and I know that you would have heard from my cousin Jackie Charles. His family, his, his nieces, his great nieces, great nephews, there's a whole number of children whose generation have been in child protection. The government, we know, um, has been, you know, all, all of this in the state that I know is in the best We've got the best child protection system. Everybody points to Victoria, but why have we got such an overrepresentation? Why have we never explored the birthright of these children? Why have we not explored the, the fact that they're cult not having strong culture, not having strong aunts, not having strong uncles, what, how that's impacted? Um, the, this government has been innovative and, and in, invested records amount, records amount, but it's at the tertiary end of the system. We're at the bottom of the cliff waiting to fam for families to fall off. We are 20% of children in care, but we get 7% of funding for family services, 7%. So where's the investment going? Um, we, I, I want to be proud that I live in a state with the lowest child removals, not the worst, but unfortunately I don't. The state that strengthens families, prevents children from entering care and has the best justice systems. We've got the most money. But that's something I want to be proud of, but I'm not proud of. We have to look at the past to see the challenges we face today, the patterns of removal, the disconnection from country. In Victoria, we have the descendants of so many families. Um, we, you know, we have funding to ACAs to take on guardianships, but this is being drip-fed. 
like if we were serious, we've got if we've got two thousand six hundred children, why are we only getting funded for guardianship for two hundred children? And if we're getting such good results, why isn't government pouring more into Aboriginal services? About the criminal justice system, now it's true that the out of home care system criminalises children, but I also know the work that we do at VACA and other ACAs. ACOs do to actually stop children from entering the youth justice system. Why isn't that visible? I know this because the data tells me. If we have less than 225 Aboriginal children now engaged um, with the youth justice system, and we know four actually incarcerated um, under 14, but what about the 2,600 children? Why aren't they translating to, ju to juvenile justice? So we are doing things, see it, see what we're doing. I think it's important. Child protection is not a guarantee, but there is a pipeline <coughs> through to justice. You will hear that 85% of children in, in the youth justice system have child protection involvement, but this isn't full, the full tr truth. It is not cause and effect. We need to ask ourselves, what are we doing right to stem as Aboriginal services to stem, see what we do good? Over COVID police trial to diversion program in high report areas. It worked then and it's still working still. Why haven't we heard about this? In our youth programs for children out of home care, we use mentoring, cultural camp, homework clubs, sport and our elders. And our ACOs do this. We wrap our children in culture. We show them that where they belong and we see results. We see reviews offending reduces, we see school improves, we see our young people getting jobs and actively contributing and becoming mentors to our younger ones. And similar, we see this with similar histories and issues, but does mainstream Australia see that? No. I think if we had a similar guardianship model that we have in child protection for juvenile justice, I believe we could better support young people, young people to stay out of the justice system. So my final words, obviously not going to be the final words for the day, but in the summarising, please don't forget history or we are deemed to repeat it. Treaty is crit critical and you've heard of things that government can act on. Please, though, I urge you as a commission, don't wait for the treaty. It can, I believe, improve processes. However, we can't afford to wait. It's important that you tell the story for us. There's a commitment from the Premier to now to child protection to actually raising the age of criminal responsibility, but we can't wait. I urge you to please um, put on, go to this government, tell them that it's critical that we raise the age urgently, that we put things in place urgently for child protection. It's important and it's time to own the past. It's important that we are seen as acting, hearing and that we are doing something, not like those who knew of the massacres and did nothing, knew of the removal of our children and did, did nothing, knew of the abuse of our human rights and did nothing. Those church-based organisations who were funded to run our missions and reserve, they walked away once the government funding um, stopped and left us vulnerable, left us at risk of child protection, of starvation. They then establish homes to place our kids where their abuses are now well, well documented through stories before the Royal Commission into Institutional Sexual Abuse. Many of these organisations are now purporting to want to help our people. But surely it's time we looked at those. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much, Auntie, for that opening um, statement and a lot of themes to draw out there. Um, I just want to pick up on one thing you just said in relation to um, the Premier, Premier Andrew's um, comments in relation to the age of criminal responsibility. Uh, the media reported the Premier's comments yesterday as saying, in Victoria, we don't rule it out as going alone. You'd be aware that um, at, ahead of the meeting of Attorney Generals at the end of this week, last week, the Northern Territory passed legislation to lift the age of criminal responsibility to the age of 12, and the ACT has moved to raise the age to 12 to 14 uh, within two years. So 12 now and then 14 within two years. So um, 
What is, um, do you think, is the sticking point in terms of this desire to have a national approach and why do you say Victoria should be courageous and move immediately to raise the age to 14? Um, firstly, I think Northern Territory should have raised it to 14, not 12. I think that, um, that really is not um, good enough. I think um, this has become a political football. Um, I think it's playing policies with um, with children's lives, and I think that we've we've got to stop um, putting politics and, and what's best for politicians. We, we've got to put children's lives before before that, and start to look at how do we really change. I I, I, I just cannot fathom how you can see a 12 year old, a 10, 11, 12, or 13 year old locked up in a juvenile facility and put into a jail cell, how can that be humanly possible? And I think Australia is well behind. I think Victoria, as one of the most progressive st states, I cannot believe that we are waiting for other states and territories to join in before we will change our legislation. Uh, I think that, you know, um, ACT and the Territory have actually started Tasmania's having discussions. But I just, it just, it, I cannot fathom why Victoria. I think it's become a political football and I think it should go outside of politics. Um, do you see that uh, as an urgent matter? Absolutely. I mean, if you think about the, the reality is that these children come from families and we need to work with the families. We need to understand what's happening in the families, what's, caused, what's contributing to a child that's offending, what's happening in the home, are there drug and alcohol, mental health, family violence? Do we need to work with those families? And so my preference, obviously, is for family-based treatment orders to be put on the parents. Um, I'm quite punitive, but I think that, you know, the parent, we need to understand why children are offending, why children are on the street, why children are not, you know, in the family home being cared for and nurtured and understand what's happening in the family. Do you know how many children in Victoria we're actually talking about coming into... Uh, these potential custodial sentences between the age of 10 and just under 14? Look, I think there's about 200. I mean, Victoria hasn't got a high juvenile ju um, justice um, cohort because, um, but I think locked up at any one time, there's very few numbers. And my understanding is there's four um, children that are actually in um, custodial set settings at the moment. So that's four um, the reality is, is that um, if you look at other states and territories, if you look at the Northern Territory, quite significant. So I think, um, but most of our, um, most of, Victoria has a very unique system where most people that are on orders serve their sentences in the community. And so it, it's the capacity to be able to get referrals because it becomes a juvenile justice approach rather than a child protection approach. And I think that what we need to understand is juvenile justice sees children as, as children in their own right, but don't actually have the authority to work with the families. And I think that what we need to do, if we're thinking about how do we improve um, juvenile justice for children under the age of 14, you actually need to be able to work with the families as well. Um, you just mentioned there a couple of different government departments. Um, can, we, can we, I just canvas with you all of the government departments that have a role in child protection, including when there's an overlap with youth, youth justice? So we've got family fairness and housing. housing yep. Uh, and we've got Department of Health generally. Yep, Department of Health have a role, yes. Yeah, and so what's the role of the Department of Health? Um, I think that, well, the Department of Health, obviously, um, mental health services, disability, there's a range of services that you would see health working with the young people and you would have, as I said, disability, mental health, there's um, a range of, and it, the reality is, is that most of these, um, most of the health services as well service young people in the justice facilities and so um, their role is to make sure that their social and emotional well-being, so there's a critical role for health in all of these services as well. Just pardon me for a moment. Um, I did have a note somewhere, sorry, Auntie, of all the different departments uh, that had a connection or possible connection in this 
I mean, I think there's space, housing but... and homelessness because young children and young people in the justice system. Um, so there's housing and homelessness, there's family violence, there's mental health, there's um, obviously a range of services. So when you think about uh, service integration and service coordination, yep. how do we work best for young people in the justice system? But how do we actually as well use, um, you know, the courts and work with the courts? Should we have different approaches in the court for young people? I think it's important. We've got our own... Um, Child Protection um, Court, I can never say the name, um, my apologies, but um, Ash, Ash Morris is, does an amazing job and the courts and Magistrate McPherson, imagine if we did that for, for young people in the justice. We don't have a, 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 a justice approach in the courts. Uh, in child protection, just taking that as a primary uh, uh, portfolio of responsibility, We've had five ministers, I think, in 14 months uh, and now a new minister appointed to that portfolio. Do you think that portfolio would be assisted by a whole-of-government approach to the issue of child protection uh, so that each of the other departments were somehow regularly involved in the contribution to design and development of policy? There's no doubt. I mean, if you think children and, um, you know, we We've got, obviously got, in Victoria, the National Close the Gap, and so there's a lot of commitments that have made through National Close the Gap, and one of the targets is to reduce child protection notifications, and so the Premier signed off to that um, agreement, and so we know that children come into care because of family violence, we know that children come into care because of homelessness, we know that children come into care because parents are incarcerated, because of mental health, um, I think that we need to understand that children come through multiple areas and it requires a whole of government response to be able to look at how do we actually make sure that um, we see children because they're quite often invisible in the system. And even when we see them, we tend to focus them back to the issue rather than looking at how do we actually better support. If you think about it, Aboriginal Housing Victoria has a lot of Aboriginal houses. They own 800 houses in Victoria. Now, they see a lot of those vulnerable families. They see a lot of those vulnerable children. But are they funded to even see or work with those family support? During COVID, they, the Aboriginal housing was funded to work with vulnerable families at risk. And the, that funding was, was able to achieve really good referral pathways to us, to health, to other services. But then when COVID finished, they took funding. So Victoria is famous for giving funding for initiatives to help deliver on better outcomes. Um, one of the things you emphasise in your report and that we hear in other evidence that the Commission will hear this week is around those early interventions or early provision of multiple services so that children are wrapped around with everything they need before they enter the child protection system. Um, what's the impact of uh, the recurrent funding, sorry, what's the impact, first of all, 
of having multiple departments with multiple interests in terms of the provisions of those multiple services. Yeah. Gosh, how long have you got? Um, I mean, I think from our point of view, uh, you know, early help is around parenting support. Early help is around um, our families feeling they have rights before a service system to be able to go and seek help that if they're, you know, not, not coping that they can go and speak to someone and get help from someone. Our people often don't feel they have the same rights. Um, Non-Aboriginal people know that if they are struggling, they can go to any service and demand it as their rights. Our people often feel that if, they're, if they go and ask for help, that their parenting will be judged and their children will be taken away. And so it, it is really critical, but I mean... <laughs> Governments fund, we, we're caught between Commonwealth and state. The Commonwealth has a view that the real Aboriginal people live in other parts of the country and so there's a lot of early help, parenting, um, supports, you've seen relationship counselling, playgroups, all of the early intervention base. Most of the priority goes to remote areas and we're not dismissing the fact that there's an evident, a need but Victoria gets very little funding. If you think about how much, how much better we would do with relationship counselling, where, where I, when families start to break down, when children, are, you know, parents are not coping, that we can provide relationship counselling. We've got parenting resources that go to mainstream organisations and there's no Aboriginal parenting information. There's no resources and there's no information about parenting, about basic parenting. Imagine if we had a centre where parent people could come in and talk and just talk about, um, you know, issues they're dealing with around, you know, they've got a new baby, they're not coping with new baby. Um, I think it's about how to, what are the things that we can put in place now, but most of the, the key, most of them are held by mainstream and government doesn't hold them to account for any outcomes on what they're delivering. So they'll get funding to work with Aboriginal and when they don't deliver, they still get the same bucket of money. That, that differential treatment by the Commonwealth in terms of support of remote and regional services versus urban or um, closely urban or, or nearly urban services, is that um, a political tussle between the state and the Commonwealth or is something else going on there? I think that the, common, um, the state and the Commonwealth, the, com the state picks which battles it'll battle. So I think it'll, you know, if, if it's going to win the housing or the Indigenous, they'll go with the housing. So it's about when we're a political football, we're often not seen as, you know, we, we need to fight for our Aboriginal um, people in Victoria to have. If we're not regional remote, and if you think about Vic Melbourne, the biggest Aboriginal population is here in Melbourne Metro, and yet Commonwealth really only want to see our rural and remote. And so they will build cultural centres outside of re metropolitan Melbourne. We cannot get any resources to build anything in Melbourne re Metro area. And so I think that the... the and, you know, like you, you think about it, you, you look at the imagery of where the Commonwealth, when they want to do a story on Aboriginal, they never come to Victoria. Mm -hmm. The Commonwealth has a lesser focus. They almost dehumanise us into that we're not Aboriginal enough because, um, you know, we, we, we don't, for them, fit the image of Aboriginal. When they want to roll out Aboriginal or even think about problems or address issues, they don't come to Victoria. Very few politicians actually fight very hard for Aboriginal Victorians. Well, would you venture any suggestions as to why they might be taking that approach? Oh, look, I, I mean, I'm smart enough to know I'm on national committees. I know the need is in Northern Territory. I know the need is in Queensland and Western Australia and remote parts of South Australia. I think there are... But we as Aboriginal people, we have rights in every state and territory... And the Commonwealth, you know, has a responsibility to deliver to all of us as citizens of this country. Mm -hmm. So it's not right that, you know, they, you know, tend to focus their energy and, and it comes down to dollars, you know. I mean, if we don't get relationship counselling, if we aren't getting parenting programmes, if, but if someone isn't holding governments to account, then I think it, it, it's, it's unfair to us as Victorians. We should get our fair share... We contribute more of the tax dollar, a, 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 quite a healthy bucket of money to the Commonwealth, 
um, where's, where's that money coming back for Aboriginal? Who asked the question? And does anyone ask the question? just want to pick up on something else you said then or, or just before about um, people not, or women not seeking support or not seeking services because of the fear of judgment. Is there a stigma or um, is there a problem with the mandatory reporting requirements that those health care service providers, schools and police have that's inhibiting women reporting issues of family violence because of a fear their children will be removed? Look, I think there's a number of things that, I mean, I think a lot of our, um, it, it's different family violence, it's different in Aboriginal communities, there's a shame factor, don't want people to know my business, don't want to know, and, um, you know, and don't want to, um, don't want my husband to be locked up. And so how do we come up with different responses and see family violence and be able to treat family violence? And so I think in Victoria, um, you just had Glenis Watts present, and so she's done an amazing job down in Gippsland. And I think the Chelcha, we are so far ahead in the family violence space as to any other state and territory, the massive investment in family violence, the fact that we've got, you know, four, uh, five Aboriginal refuges in Victoria, I think we're doing our bit. I think it's more about how do we actually uh, make sure, I mean, that our women are safe, that they are safe to come forward, that we do all the safety planning. Mm -hmm. I think, as I said, I think it's more about how do, we, how do we get, empower women to be able to come forward and seek help and support them to... And how do we do a lot more work with earlier with young women, with girls in the school, the education system? We have to do it, you know, work around peer support. We've got so many young girls that are struggling with their peers in the school city, situation. So I think for us, it requires, and I think the investment has to be really significantly into, you know, how do we change? And but some of the systems are really, if you go to a government agency. They don't see our culture. They don't see the fact that we're Aboriginal and, we, and treat us differently. And so, you know, the first thing that an Aboriginal person will do is, is watch the person's body, body language, whether they're interested or not. And so I think a lot of the issues that we have in Australia doesn't see us as first peoples that, and, and understand our culture. If I went to a, a Muslim country, I would learn about the Muslim culture. But... Most Australians have never, ever learned about Aboriginal culture, how to engage with us, how to work with us, how to talk to us or how to treat us. Um, can I come back to that in a second? You just remind me, of course, that one of the very important portfolios for a minister is Treaty and First Nations and um, concurrently held by the Minister for Family Violence. And we heard from Minister Williams earlier in the year. So certainly in terms of a whole-of-government approach, that portfolio should be at the table, I imagine, and important to treaty discussions going on in terms of self-determination, control of processes, control of outcomes for First Nations people. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think the Minister now for Family Violence is Ros Spence. So, um, yeah, so we've already had really good engagement. There's a national plan now, we, now and so um, I'm on the National Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Advisory um, Council for Developing a, a Domestic Violence, Family Violence and Sexual Abuse. Um, one thing we haven't addressed in our, obviously, submission is the issue of sexual abuse in our communities, and I think it's historical, and I know that many of our women have been exposed. We, we tend to... That's one of the most significant issues in the historical sexual abuse and not being able to respond. The very fact that when um, White Australia came here... They saw women as commodities. Um, to they saw us as you know open, I guess open slather. The very sexualised nature, the fact that our women wore very little clothing, meant that you know white Australia saw us as a commodity for them. And you can read through all of the history and all of the letters about the sexual abuse. Um, the fact that the reason why so many of our fair children were taken away from missions and reserve because they were signed that there was, you know, activities perpetrated by the white protectors of our children. And so my dad 
was 14, fair-skinned, lived on Lake Tyre's mission and was removed because he had fair skin at 14, um, only because he had fair skin. Mm. And what are the flow-on effects of those activities and behaviour that was not um, the subject of any intervention or it was encouraged by the state back? You can see the harsher penalties, so you know, to remove us from the site of the community. So they knew that they, my father being on late tyres, he was going to be a visible sign that something had happened. Mm. Um, and it would, you know, it would question what was happening on the missions mm. and at, on, on the reserves at those times. But I think um, for my dad, I mean, it set up a life. How, how do you at 14 go and find a life? How do you actually go and find a job when you've got no trade and you've been taken away, you've not been taught, you know, your traditions around hunting and gathering and being able to. So I think, you know, I, I guess I'm very fortunate that, you know, my dad was hardworking and he was able to provide for me for mm. my life. I'm just coming to your report and picking up your earlier comment about the role of institutions. Page uh, 10 of the report, you begin... Um, a series of recommendations. There are 52 recommendations in total. Can I just ask you to look at recommendation nine yep. in relation to um, the recommendations you make around adoption and permanent care orders? Can I ask you to speak about, you've mentioned government, can I ask you to speak about the role of other institutions and your concerns around access to institutional records? Yeah. Um, did you want to respond, Sarah? Or? No. No? no. Um, so, I mean, we, at the moment, as Aboriginal Services, where um, there's a permanent care order, when a permanent care order is made, um, they will ask for an Aboriginal um, organisation to actually... Um, write, um, interview the family and write a report to the court. What is really, really difficult is quite often we're asked to write this report after the child's been in a placement for four, five years and it's very, very difficult to be able to... Um, and what we find is for many of these children, no one's ever done the work to um, find their Aboriginal family, connect them back and find grandparents. And so we're al almost always caught at odds with, um, with child protection and the courts because we want to pursue the child's links. And what we found is that many of, a lot of our children have never had kept the links with their Aboriginal family and community. And so when these permanent care court orders go through, we put a lot of emphasis on maintaining connection. But let me tell you, the permanent care orders aren't worth the paper they're written on. They're not. They don't, they don't hold any. They're just written. Um, we had a permanent care order written on, and you know, was on an Aboriginal girl. A young Aboriginal girl came from a big Aboriginal family in Victoria. The girl was Aboriginal. There was a commitment made in the um, permanent care order that the child would keep connections with their um, Aboriginal family, their large Aboriginal family. When the child was fostered, um, basically the carers changed her name, changed her identity, um, said that she was Torres Strait Islander and not Aboriginal, and um, she has never had access or met any of her siblings or cousins. And there's no room for anybody to be able to fight. And so, to me, it doesn't matter what we write into a permanent care order or what we would... Um, we would never be able to change it. The, the, the issue is um, with it, adoptions, we don't actually have any role, no Aboriginal service. So in Canada and, and um, in America, you actually have to get approval from a traditional owner um, tradition, so the child's traditional owner group to be able to adopt a child out of that um, and it's basically about um, the, the traditional owner group um, being able to give permission for that family to adopt but there are conditions as well that the traditional owner group will put in and then the court has to uh, comply with that. 
but in Australia there's no court orders, there's no capacity to review and there's no capacity to follow up whether those conditions are applied. So that means that anybody that fosters or uh, an Aboriginal or permanently um, takes a child doesn't have to comply with any cultural obligations. They don't have to return the child to country. They don't have to do any language immersion. They don't have to have anything to do with siblings. They can completely cut off complete links with the child's Aboriginal culture. Aren't the cultural management plans meant to address those issues? Yeah, the cultural support plans are there. They're developed, but it, it's up to the goodwill of the foster care as to whether they actually, after the permanent care application's gone through, as to whether they can just rip it up and, and you know, just because it's not... There's nobody that follows up on it. There's no capacity. Um, so there's no accountability for those uh, cultural plans. Um, you mentioned their goodwill, the goodwill of the carers. Is there also an issue about capacity of those carers to implement those plans? Look, I mean, there's some extreme examples. I, I, I ran into a, a previous permanent carer of, of um, VAC, a, a previous foster carer of VACA that went to permanent care. I ran it, into her at an Australia Day event and she was just came up to me and she said, if I didn't know I'm going to permanent care meant that I was going to lose my VACA family, that I wasn't going to have access to your Christmas days, to your extended, to all of the events and activities that you run for children in foster care... I would never have moved to permanent care. And so um, it's tragic that Aboriginal organisations like us can only maintain or keep connected with the children that are in our care, that once you move to permanent care, you have to give away any links with any Aboriginal services because quite often we are the Aboriginal family of many of our Aboriginal children and many of our Aboriginal carers and many, many non-Aboriginal carers. And so... Um, it, it's sad when, you know, they do move to permanent care that they do lose us. So how's that impacting on the children that you're seeing? Look, I, I think that... Um, I, I think if we get all the processes, if, if the carers are really do the work to keep the child connected to culture, I think that, um, you know, there's obviously lots of examples. I think, as a foster, to be truthful, as a foster care system, we're much better with girls... Um, we're much better at looking at young girls. I think um, that we struggle with how do we support young men. I think one of the things that we need to really think about is what we need to do to, to raise and think about young boys that haven't been raised. I mean, we're not living in traditional times, but we know that many of the young people that are in out-of-home care, where they don't have strong connection with Aboriginal culture, where they don't have strong Aboriginal role models they're more likely to end up in the justice system because they, they, they're conflicted about their culture, they're conflicted about their identity, they don't fit in. So how do we actually create in, uh, situations where children feel connected and, and have that? And so a lot of our work is around making sure that we're um, doing a lot of peer supports. And so one of the most successful programs we have is in the southern region where we have a number of young people that um, we pick up for the breakfast program. Um, they come beforehand, they do all sorts of boxing clubs and then they have a breakfast together. Then they go to school and we're found, finding that their, attention, that their attendance at school and then afterwards we pick them up and we do homework clubs and then we drop them off afterwards. So we're finding that that has multiple and many of the... Um, people that are involved in it have seen many of these young children would have ended up in justice. But we, what we do is link them in with strong Aboriginal men, um, but not all of our communities have that capacity. And so how do we build our own infrastructure around strong Aboriginal men that work with children in child protection and understand a lot of people don't like child protection. They hate, they think it's, oh, we don't want to touch it, it's... it's but. What we're seeing is, is that now, with a number of Aboriginal community-controlled organisations across Victoria funded, so at the moment there are 19 Aboriginal organisations are funded, what we're seeing is a lot more ex exposure to camps, to cultural business, to ceremonies, and, and including men's yarning circles, women's yarning circles, and I think those are the es essential things that we need to build into a child protection system, is what are the things that we... What's the cultural business of child protection 
that we need to embed into all of our responses and work with children and families. You just mentioned school attendance there and um, the report talks about the correlation between school attendance and or non-school attendance and the youth and then adult justice systems. So if these programs are demonstrated to be working in terms of encouraging school attendance, you would expect a flow-on effect in the justice system. It's exactly right. But also to um, better mental health, better, you know, um, psychological health and, and ability. We know that um, children that are conflicted about who they are, they don't know who they are they struggle throughout the whole system. So it's important that our children know who they are, are strong in their Aboriginal. We know that most, most children that go through the multifunctional Aboriginal children's services or any Aboriginal early years services do much better. They're ready for school and, and they're, they're strong in their culture. Um, you know, I think people don't realise that when a child goes to school and somebody says you're Aboriginal, you know, for a child to be proud of that, that that's what we want. We want to create children that are proud to identify as Aboriginal and are strong in that and don't, you know, don't have that fear factor and to be proud of being an Aboriginal child. Mm. Um, you mentioned before um, we came into the room the early learning, sorry, the early parenting centre. There's one of those now operating. Could you just tell the Commission about what that early parenting centre is and does and whether they, we need more of them? Um, there's been funding um, made available to um, First Nations Health in Frankston to um, develop an early um, early year centre, but um, our issue is it, it's great and it, it's needed, but it's going to have a really greater function more on health and maternal and child health. Um, like um, my personal story is that um, I had triplets myself. Um, and I wasn't coping when I came home from the hospital. Um, no sleep, sleep deprivation. Um, and back then there wasn't any home help or anything. Um, I, I went to maternal and child health and they wanted me to go into an early parenting centre to, to be able to um, help me. But, uh, you know, I had, didn't know the language of stolen gents. I didn't know about removal. All I knew was that you couldn't trust mainstream organisations to help you. And so in my mind, I said, no, I'm not going in. I won't go in. But my health deteriorated so badly. I was just These babies were, you know, taking me an hour to feed each one. And by the time I finished the first one, it was time to start on the, the third one. And I was just in a world of pain. But I, um, the Maternal and Child Health Centre really helped, did help me. It helped me put the kids in routines. And it was there. And we've been working with the QEC very much around integrating a lot of our child welfare programs in, with QEC. They have broken the mould. They're a mainstream organisation but definitely have a commitment to Aboriginal and have worked with us for a very long period of time to change the way government thinks about Aboriginal and, and working with Aboriginal. Um, we, we got joint funding with them to run um, a mainstream program. And... Um, QEC, the government, um, you know, said, well, we'll put it in QEC. And QEC said, no, we'll put it in FACA. Government said to QEC, oh, but what about all the white clients? And QEC was said, well, don't Aboriginal people have to go into white organisations every day? Why, why not put it in FACA? And so we put it in FACA and everybody still came. So there's some real racist stereotyping um, for Aboriginal people, but the early parenting centres can be uh, critical, but um, government's committed to, you know, uh, uh, all these early years services, but not one of them is Aboriginal, not one, and they don't see the need for an Aboriginal early years parenting centre. Imagine if we could work. Look at all the unborn notifications. We're waiting for babies to be born at hospital to remove kids. Imagine if we had our own early years parenting centre. I think we could change the world. Sorry. Um, so obviously you're a fan of the early parenting centre model. Oh, my children came home, they, they actually took their bottles and they went to sleep and I mean, my life was chaos, chaos but I had a two-year-old that helped me as well. Um, in the context of um, 
the discussion around self-determination, you address that issue in the submission. And I want to take you to page um, 21 of the submission. Council, could I just ask a yes, question, please. if, if yes. that's all right? Um, Honey Meryl, just to go back to um, permanent care, as you mentioned before, would I be correct? Is there a certain Can amount? You of, talk, um, just a oh, little bit. Is there a certain amount of time a child needs to be in care before they can be put on a permanent care order? Um, it's usually a time frame of about two years, but I mean, governments have been trying to make it that it's you know. It, it, it works to stability. What they're trying to do is really, you know, it's sort of, I mean, it's a bit of a catch. We, I've heard Aboriginal children say, why didn't you make a decision to place me with my aunt earlier rather than keep on trying to take me back home to mum when mum wasn't changing? And then we've had, like, um, mums that have, you know, really done the hard yards and, you know, we've put the intensive work in and children have gone home. But it's usually about two years, Sue. And um, there's no oversight of a child once it's gone into permanent care? No follow-up, no... With, you know. But, I mean, America's moved to a process where they're moving to permanent care much more quickly um, and it's an, in, in, they're in a world of pain because... You know, on one, I saw a presentation, and America put this up as that all children will go to permanent care earlier. But then you've got another organisation set up because of the number of permanent care breakdowns because um, child protection bringing children back. Can, can I ask, sorry, sorry, Council, can I just ask, do you see a high rate of children being returned from permanent care? And I know you spoke about young boys, and you probably won't even have this off the top of your head, but it's just, I'm just wondering, <coughs> is there a high rate of return from permanent care of kids coming back into care? And if so, male or female? No, it's, um, I guess because it takes so long and most of these children are really stabilised in those placements. So, but it'd be really great if we could go through and explore records and actually, you know, do an investigation about whether people have complied. I think you can see the most extreme, Sue, and you would know. Um, I think the worst um, permanent care plan I saw written was that um, a child uh, from a very big Aboriginal family in Victoria was going to be um, permanently planned to a family and they were moving to South Australia. And uh, in a report to the court, they wrote that they would um, take the child to the museum as part of the child's exposure to culture. And so very not really understanding or thinking if you just take them to the museum that that would fulfil the cultural obligations. So clearly, I think White Australia doesn't have an understanding of cultural obligations and what they mean for Aboriginal people. And even for a lot of our young people, I think cultural obligation, responsibilities, so langu language and all of those things are critical that we build into, just generally into our community, because if we don't fulfil our own obligations, then our next generation don't actually honour what are our traditional obligations as First Peoples to learn our language, to be able to know our stories and to be able to pass those stories on. Would you say then our children in permanent care would be lost to culture, lost to community? Would they start? That's related back, say, to, to well, colonisation. Well, I mean, you saw what happened with Russell Savage. You saw what happened with him where he, you know, that was a family that um, fostered him, went to permanent care. They never fulfilled any of the obligations. They took him overseas. There was no permission to take him overseas. We didn't... If, if it's a foster carer, they would have had to have got approval. So I think if, if you're looking at the failures of the child protection system, just have a look at Russell Moore, mm. Russ Moore Savage, yeah. Thank you, Annie Muriel. Thank just, you. just following up on Commissioner Hunter's questions there, the permanency objective of the Act presumably has an intention of stability, to give the child some stability. But it sounds like what you're saying is that it's counterproductive because it means children don't have... There's no visibility of those children once they're in care and, in fact, they can be lost to the system. Yeah, I mean, 
and some of the foster carers that we get um, are, are racist. They don't believe that um, they, 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 they want the child, but they don't want an Aboriginal child. They want a, they want a perfect little um, child, but they don't want anything to do with the Aboriginal family or any, because of, you know, a lot of racism. We've seen some families that have wanted to change um, the name of the child have fought us in court to change the identity of the child and have brainwashed the child to say the child is not Aboriginal. So there are extreme cases, um, and I think one of the case studies we've actually included in this one is where a child from um, Northern Ter um, South Australia was bought from traditional lands, bought here um, by a non-Aboriginal carer, a non-person, that non-Aboriginal person, not, not a non-person, so no disrespect, um, but a non-Aboriginal person that um, had taken the child um, with that, what she is saying is permission from, you know, elders in the community to take the child. And five years later, we find out that that child, um, there's no guardianship. The woman turns up at the um, Royal Children's Hospital with um, wanting to get treatment for this child and the guardianship. And so we've been locked up in a court boat case with the mum is now a traditional owner woman, wants her child back, wants her Aboriginal child back, and we're in the courts. Just to cut a long story short, because it's quite a long story, but we're fighting for this child, this Aboriginal child, with rights to a tradition, to culture, to family, um, and yet stability, and the courts are saying that this child perhaps should be with this non-Aboriginal woman that's had care of her for five years. Mm. And so the longer the system drags on, the more it favours the foster... And the, the balance goes to stability, mm. not to the rights of the child, not to even... This child had a mother, the mother had a, a, other children, she was doing really well living on land, and the mother was putting evidence in the court that the child's culture was being ignored, the child's right. She wasn't learning her ceremony, she was growing up without all of the... Because there are things that in traditional culture at particular times that you need to teach young girls and young women, and she felt that none of those milestones were going to be met and that this child was going to miss out, really, on the on being taking up her rightful heritage. Mm. heritage. Just as a general observation, do the Children's Court give weight to those sort of submissions of parents who are saying that they wish their child to be exposed to culture and you know, have a sense of connection? Or is that something that courts are not presently able to manage and deal with appropriately? I think you can see, like, through the dedicated child protection court that we have, you can see the difference where Magistrate McPherson, Ash Firebrace, and they do all the work. The magistrate actually sits down with Aboriginal families and, and does the work. I think, obviously, you know, the legal profession would know. Um, the, the legal profession are a law unto themselves, um, no disrespect, to you, but, um, you know, and it's adversarial. And so we, we get caught in the middle of child protection, the magistrate and the Aboriginal people wanting to put an Aboriginal um, just doesn't have a threshold for legal. So being able to, to be Aboriginal, that, that's, there's no recognition of what it is to be Aboriginal and, and to be able to establish and, and, and have a database for the magistrates to be able to say, have you... You know, has the child got a return to country? Have they got a genealogy? Have they had, you know, do they know who their aunts and uncle? Have they got story? That doesn't meet within the court's barometer of looking at the best interests of children. Mm -hmm. So stability, health, well, education, all of those things are important. But for Aboriginal children, knowing who you are, mm -hmm. being able to connect, being able to um, be able to live as an Aboriginal child is critical as well. So, so that brings me back to the placement principles and where I wanted to take you with the legislation that lapsed in the last parliament, which you discuss on page 22 under the, in the context of this issue of self-determination. Um, do you have page 22 there in the last paragraph we all shall wish to highlight? So the Children, Youth and Families Amendment Act Child Protection Bill 
2021, followed by the Children and Health Legislation Amendment Statement of Recognition and Other Matters Bill 2022, lapsed in the last Parliament. We, we know that. Um, and do you know whether that's back on the agenda now for the new Parliament? I might get Sarah, do you want to answer that? I mean, we can ask government for their input yeah. into this question as well, of course, but... Um, I just, just want to make your... sure Sarah's put on the spot as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The transcript, yes. Um, so we do know that it was meant to go through in the last sitting. However, the Queen died um, and that... Um, for a spanner in the works? It definitely <laughs> did. Uh, so we do have... Um, we have reassurances that it will get back on the agenda as soon as possible. Mm. Within the next three months. Yeah, so as soon as we can. So we assume in the first or soon soonish sittings of next year, that bill, the recognition bill, initially had an increase to the age of criminal responsibility, but that was controversial and it was removed. Is that the history of it? There's a little bit more to it than that. It's, it's actually linked to the Youth Justice Bill, Yes. Um, and so in getting the Statement of Recognition Bill through, which is really focused on our ability to take on investigations so that we can act earlier to help families to possibly stay together, to put those strengthening mechanisms in place um, on a child protection notification, hopefully so we don't have to remove children. Um, if we'd kept the Raise the Age and everything together, the, the bill may not have passed. And then my understanding is that um, the Youth Justice Bill, which is currently also being worked on, would have then taken the Raise the Age out of the Child, Youth and Family Act and put into the Youth Bill. So there are lots of moving parts, um, but the most important part of getting this legislation pushed through is our ability to take on the investigative um, function which still, as um, Annie Muriel talked about before, that still has arbitrary uh, targets. So within, when we get to start that process, ho hopefully as soon as possible, um, we still have a target of, for VACA, we only get to investigate 90 targets. We currently have 800 kids in care. So that's just 90 notifications. So again, in terms of what we spoke about in, in guardianship, there are 2,600 children in out-of-home care, but we only have targets for 200 for guardianship. And then the same for this for investigations. Between ourselves and Bendigo, there's targets of 130 for investigations, yet we know that there's a pipeline of kids coming into child protection. So, so what's the consequence of that? The consequence is we're going to burn through that target really quickly mm. um, and unfortunately that comes with fixed resources. So if we hit the target of 90 in three months, we don't know if we'll be able to then actually support more families. And our aim with our approach to this is that with those, um, our outcome is for those 90 families that we get to engage with is to strengthen them to keep the child at home. Um, but we could be doing that for so many more families. Mm -hmm. And while it's us and Bendigo that are on a trial, mm -hmm. imagine what we could do if it was statewide. Mm -hmm. So, and we only get to do it in the north. Mm -hmm. VACA operates in the east, the south and the west, mm -hmm. but we just get the north. So it's very limiting. Um, piecemeal. Yeah. I'm sorry, Auntie, I missed you. I said piecemeal. So, I mean, um, what it means is if, you know, there's 500 notifications within a month and we're only going to work with 90. So if I was one of those other Aboriginal families that didn't get the same service, it's sort of a, we're really sort of going to be discriminating against many of the Aboriginals. So how do we actually prioritise? And so, it's, again, it's piecemeal, like giving us a little bit, but and it's, it's always this thing about we've got to do an as-if to demonstrate that we can do it. And they're not even, at this stage, they're not relinquishing all of their power and authority. So it's still a little bit, even when we we had to do as if guardianship and it, it took us so long, like the legislation was in place in 2005. It wasn't until 2017 
that we took on full guardianship. So even with the investigations, if we start with 90, imagine how long it's going to be before we can actually roll it out. But there, I think the department can do. They just don't like giving up their power and, and, and authority and, and it's, it, they've got a real um, view that, you know, we as Aboriginal people, we're not, we don't have the same standards. And I, I, I definitely know that we have much higher standards. We have seen situations where we've rescued children where the department has been failing. We, we've had one particular case where, the, where there was a child almost at death when we went to visit this child and they had not visited or seen this child. And if it wasn't for us taking at, over... At all? They hadn't seen or visited them? They had, they had not sighted the child. They talked to the carer, had not sighted the child. We, before we would take over this kinship placement, we said we want to cite the child and family. That that child was almost two weeks from death from malnutrition. If it wasn't for us actually taking on that that child and actually wanting to see the child, that child would today not be with us. And now the child's with the Aboriginal father. That's the other element that we haven't put in. Aboriginal men don't figure in child protection as well. So we don't actually often look for Aboriginal men. If you're with a non-Aboriginal woman, we tend to go with the um, non-Aboriginal woman's maternal. We're a very maternal system, so I think it's preferenced, and particularly Aboriginal men in, in child welfare often don't even get considered to be carers of their children or, or their family considered to be able to take on the care of. Well, Auntie Eva Jo gave evidence yesterday about having to choose between her son... Uh, and her grandchildren, because her son was seen, in effect, as a, a harm factor, a potential harm factor. So yeah. um, having to make those decisions must be um, very difficult for And it families. isn't only Eva Jo, mm. son, so lucky to have her. Mm. She f knows child protection and she's fought child... She fights child protection every day. Mm. And why don't... You know, that's what we need is strong aunts, strong mums, strong uncles, strong fighting for children. But not everybody has an Auntie Eva Jo as a grandparent to be able to fight the system or understand the system. Um, those 90 children that, you're, that, that come within your target, are they just the first in the door or are they prioritised in some way? How, how are those, once you get to 90, that's it? There's a cut-off through the year or how, how are those? I think we're going to try and work with the most complex. I, I think I think our, our VACA's view is try and work with the most complex families, the hardest ones, rather than go for the easy ones. Um, when we took on the ASIF, we, we could have taken, you know, much earlier, um, you know, families much earlier and, and been able to really get some easy runs. But we didn't do that. We actually put children that were on long-term orders because we knew that they were the most complex. So, you know, like we, we had um, a, a one day, um, in a one-day sitting of the court um, with Magistrate McPherson. Gee, I wish I could remember the name of the court. Do you know anybody? No. no. You're you asking about the come. name of another magistrate? Ma magistrate came at first yes. from the... From Who we're hearing the, from next week. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, and so Ash Fibre, so... Oh, this Friday. Yeah, sorry. There. So on it, and, and she, she did a video and she talked to us about, in one day sitting, um, five children went home. Now, these are children that were on long-term orders, been in care for over two years, and we do a high five when, you know, one child goes home, but five children in one day. And the work that we did between, and this was, um, one was for a young mum with, Two ch with three children, and those three children, the mum had been through Odyssey House, had done um, all of the programs, all of the service, and done all of the things. And she's produced a video for us to say that if it wasn't for uh, our Noogle program and the work of the combination of a good court system of not of having decision making with Aboriginal means that children go home. Um. I just want to come back to the Act, or the two Acts that, you, that we've been talking about. I take it you would see the passage of those Acts as urgent reforms that are, the government needs to act on 
as soon as possible. Yeah, look, I mean, there are parts of the Act that, you know, like the, the government holds you to such... And then there's so, so many parts of the Act that they just don't hold themselves to account to, mm. which is very frustrating. And so, you know, um, obviously um, guardianship and the fact that it was in legislation for all those years and they didn't do it, and so it's in, in legislation now and they only, they're only drip-feeding it out. Um, the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle um, has been in legislation for a number of years. I mean, for many years. When, in 2005, when we were reviewing the legislation, we had to um, really sort of strengthen the language because um, the Act at that time read that the um, courts may take into consideration the Aboriginal Child Placement Principle. So we had to work really hard to get um, it into will take into consideration. But um, what's happened over the years and, you know, the ideologies of governments have changed, but the, the reality is, is that um, nobody really, and I know you want to ask the question about self-determination, but in, in, in looking at a child protection system, what we've got is the system... Um, and where Aboriginal people are passive recipients, and so we're sitting here waiting for government to tell, tell us what we should do about how do we protect our kids. We sit in the courts, and the courts tell us how, what we need to do. And so um, with the changes in the legislation, what we want to be able to do is move to be really sort of the most influential of the states over there, they actually introduced them. Um, they, they found that the numbers, and we know that children of colour are overrepresented across, you know, every state and every country. And so one country in America, and I can send the, the, the report, what they did is de-identified. And so they didn't, they took away the um, identity of the child and the name of the child, because obviously names, people know particular family names. And what they found is that the numbers of children of colour actually reduced by just taking away the, the name of the children and the, um, the heritage of the child they were able to actually see. So I still think that we have racist systems and very racist systems. You, have, you only have to look at the Northern Territory. You only have to look at the numbers of children. Why so many? Mm. Why so many Aboriginal children in the Northern Territory in care? Um, we've only got to page 27 of your statement so far. No, it's all been very instructive. Thank you. And the three things you had wanted to mention as a matter of um, priority were the Raise the Age, the Early Parenting Centre and the passage of this bill, which is the subject of your recommend, one of your recommendations. I still want to, I still want to also hold to account the, main, the mainstream organisations. Yeah. The, the institutions and their records. Yep. Um, so what I might do is invite the commissioners to see whether they have any questions at this point, and then I'll just do a quick page flip to see if there's any other of those issues that you said you wanted to highlight okay. in the remainder of your report, and what we'll do is we'll get you back so we don't lose the opportunity to hear from you on these other important issues. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Commissioners? Oh, I've got a million questions, but I'm not sure uh, we've got time, really. Um, perhaps I'll confine myself to just... Can you just turn your mic up a little bit? Sorry. Is that a bit better? Yeah. 
just one question or one topic. You mentioned human rights. You opened on that subject. Uh, and uh, the Victorian Charter is supposed to uh, bring human rights accountability uh, to government, including the child protection system. Uh, it's, it's, it's supposed to ensure that uh, Aboriginal culture is respected in making decision-making. It's supposed to ensure that the system operates in a non-discriminatory manner. Uh, it's, it's supposed to uphold the, the rights to family and the best interests of the child. And all of these things you've said are wanting. Yeah. Um, and, um, the question I ask you uh, is, do you see human rights accountability uh, in the way that the Victorian child protection system actually operates? Yeah, and I, I think our submission goes to that around charters and conventions, and so it, it's absolutely critical because, um, I mean, it, it, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, it clearly spells out um, the rights of the children to identify as a and the to Andrew Jackamos when he did the, you know, Task Force 1000 when he was Commissioner for Children. He, what he found was when Aboriginal services are involved in, in, in any way with an Aboriginal child, the child's exposure to culture is, is, is absolutely, you know, assured. So how do we actually get the child protection system to actually include greater Aboriginal, you know, involvement in children's life. But one of the things that we need to put in place, some of the things, that, because it's not compulsory to have a genealogy, it's not compulsory to have a return to country, none of those things are part, they are the things that we do as an Aboriginal organisation. Before I sign up for cultural support plan, I ask, is there a genealogy? Um, the department um, sees that... You only need three levels of a cultural support plan. So that means my mother, my grandfather and my great-grandfather. Whereas, to me, I want to know all of my general. I want to know where all my family comes from. And so I think we, we still get caught up in a Western construct of how do we do it quickly and neatly and, and just tick a box rather than follow it you know, a really sort of re well-researched way to ensure children enjoy the richness of who they are and that we actually envelop them in their own culture, not just give them a book and say, here's your, you know, what you're to do as an Aboriginal person. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, we've heard already, we're only in day two of... I told you you had to talk loud if you... <laughs> talk louder. Uh, we've heard already, we're only in day two of a system in which... Aboriginal voices are not heard, where the overrepresentation of Aboriginal children gets rises with every level of intervention, where there is no trust or little trust from Aboriginal families, where change is piecemeal and grudging and tiny. Is the system redeemable or is it, you know, totally broken? Totally broken. And broken for Aboriginal people, um, you know,
Western evaluation and Western systems. And so at the moment, there's, a, you know, an over-reliance on bringing in Western MST, you know, multisystemic therapy, cognitive behaviour therapy, all FBT and all these Western constructs that you can't change and that don't see Aboriginal families. But nobody wants to build in an Aboriginal evidence base about what works, what will evaluate. Have a look at what Aboriginal communities are doing every day. Have a look at, you know, no, not meaning to really sort of highlight it, but have a look at Haywood. There's no child, very little child protection in that community because they've got strong elders, strong aunts, strong uncles. They're doing early years work. They've got people going to school. Report, you do a um, comprehensive review of the implementation of some of the recommendations of the Bringing Them Home in Inquiry Report. And you mentioned the use of the National uh, Sorry Day Scorecard, which was last produced in 2015. One aspect of that scorecard is to look at um, healing reparations policy, the policy environment. Can I invite you to offer some observations in relation to the issue of healing and reparations. Poverty driven, whether it's you know the fact that um, you know so many of our people live with family violence. I mean, the you know state of Victoria's children in 2009 talked about the fact that Aboriginal children are born into um, trauma. So they live in houses where there's a number of funerals, where there's bad health, where there's family violence, where there's suicide. Children come in, and, and Richard Franklin talks about the cultural load that Aboriginal people bear, you know, just having to, you know, live as an Aboriginal person and, and have to deal with that. Um, and so for us in child welfare, understanding that any time you re remove it, any time a child hits the child protection system, they've been through trauma. The family have been through trauma, through a high level of violence. And so, but do we have a system that actually addresses it? Do we think, focus on cultural therapeutic ways? Do we actually, you know, embed culture and healing treatments? Do we think about, you know, men's business, women's business? Do we actually, um, you know, work with families in the context of, you know, where they're at with their violence, with their mental health, with, with their issues? And so I, I think, no, we don't. But um, I think we're moving that way. I think in Victoria we have a number of healing services. We've got Nanya Berang, which is a healing um, program, but it's never been fully rolled out. We know what we've got to do. It's just trying to get government to see that as critical for Aboriginal people, that we need to bring about healing. And I think that I would love the Commission to have a focus on what does healing and how do we actually heal the past and what could we have done in the past to heal? 
Well, you've probably already addressed this in various um, places in your evidence, but the importance of healing, including reparations and justice for those um, people who've been affected by past violence, uh, violence in the past through colonial acts that you've described in your evidence. How important is that healing for children in the, at risk of child protection exposure or, or, or interaction with child protection systems today? Look, I think um, out of all this, I mean, I think most people would say, um, I just want acknowledgement that what's happening is wrong. I want to know want to be able to hear that it's not going to happen for another one. I think um, having, having dealt with a number of clients that have gone for reparations through um, the Royal Commission into you know, um, Institutional Sexual Abuse, a lot of what they particularly for sexual abuse at the hands of, um, you know, many of the, you know, institutions that were, you know, placed or put there to care for them. Mm. Um, Auntie, I don't want to rush your important evidence, um, as you described in your submission, about the interaction of children in the justice system, including police, police discretions, court system sentencing. Uh, so if you're content to do so, we'll get you back on another occasion. Yeah, look, I mean, I think that I know that you're going to hear from the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service, and I think um, if I was to really sort of hone in on some of the things, I think that we have an amazing justice agreement in Victoria. Um, I think that we, we're up to iteration four of that justice agreement. as well, deliver on justice outcomes. And I don't mean locking up people or having parole officers. I think about how, how we actually can address justice issues, but also draw the correlation between high-risk families, children, and do, uh, I think, the integration of family mediation. I think an approach where we can work more closely with families is critical. So can, can we get you back to talk about those things? It would be lovely to, yeah. Council. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, this afternoon uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Jill Gallagher. Um, uh, I understand, uh, Chair, that uh, you have been made aware um, by Ms McLeod in this morning's session that uh, we'll be seeking an order pursuant to Section 26 for uh, some of the evidence to be given on a closed or, or restricted basis. Um, I, I ask whether those orders have been made at the present time or not. Uh, not those orders. I've just done the one from this morning. I'm not sure that... Are they in the uh, in written quest? No, thank um, you, Chair. I, I misunderstood. I, I thought that the, those orders were... Uh, we were speaking about the same orders. Uh, I'll, make a, I'll make that application at the appropriate time this, uh, later this afternoon. Okay. All right. But there will be a... a uh, a piece of evidence from uh, this witness that will be on a restricted basis. Uh, it was the previous witness's evidence, sorry. <coughs> but it'll, it'll be done in time, yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I call uh, Jill Gallagher. Uh, um, and, um, you, um, Chair and Commissioners, you'll note that uh, Auntie Jill is 
uh, currently in the uh, witness area with a support person. Um, uh, uh, before we commence, um, could you just uh, tell the commissioners your full name, uh, Auntie Jill? Thank you. Yes, um, my name's Jill Gallagher. Um, I am uh, Gundij Mara woman from Western Victoria. Um, and I'm also currently the uh, CEO of VACHO. Uh, and also prior to that, well, during that time, I was also um, uh, the former Treaty Commissioner. Um, so thank you. Is that enough? Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, in relation to the evidence that uh, you're to give this afternoon, um, that evidence is uh, truthful evidence to the best of your knowledge? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Thank you. Now, um, I'm aware that uh, we're aware that uh, you uh, know some of the uh, commissioners quite well, uh, and Jill, but uh, I would ask you to simply uh, describe uh, for the commission what Vacho's role is. Okay. Um, Vacho is a uh, peak body for Aboriginal health and wellbeing in the state of Victoria. Um, we currently have, our role is to try and influence government, uh, try to in influence government decision making, their policy making, and also uh, how they uh, how they um, provide funding to Aboriginal community controlled organisations. Uh, we've been in existence now for 25 years. We were first incorporated back in 1996. Prior to that, there were a lot of people before me who played the role in trying to be a strong voice for Aboriginal people in the health and wellbeing space. We had the uh, tripartite agreements. We had the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service and some elders who set up that health service who, who fought hard to have a strong voice um, to government, not in government, there's a difference, uh, in relation to trying to influence the government policy. Thank you. Um, and uh, VACHO, uh, as an organisation, has made a submission to this uh, commission? Yes, we have. We've made a, a submission in relation to our views relation to child protection and also the justice system. Uh, thank you. And you can assume that the commissioners have a copy of, of that submission. Now, um, is there also a, a capacity building or capacity development role that VACHO has with respect to its members? VACHO, yes, there is. VACHO has 32 Aboriginal, organisation, Aboriginal organisations who are based around the state of Victoria. Not all of them uh, provide the, uh, all the social determinants of health services. Um, some of them, 16 of the 32, have clinics, um, uh, and, and I'll use Rumbalara as an example. Rumbalara is one of our biggest members, and they actually have, they started out as a little health service in a little old shack, um, and they've grown to be uh, a health and wellbeing uh, service that, that tries to address the social determinants of health for their communities. Um, so that ranges from health service to residential aged care to aged care in the home, early years. Um, they try to do prevention work in the, um, um, in the child protection space. Well, maybe I wouldn't call it child protection space because um, they try to do prevention work in areas to try and support families and do prevention work with those families. Mm. And there are members that are, are not providing um, health services as such? Yes, we have some of our members, only a short, short, um, um, you know, like Mullum Mullum Gathering Place is not a service provider, so to speak, but they do provide support to their communities around connection, staying connected as a, as a community. It's really hard. Well, I know it's really hard for me anyways. I mean, I live in urban Melbourne um, and staying, staying connected to my mob in Melbourne where I live, it's really hard because it's a big built up city. Um, so that, those hubs, those um, gathering places are really important for those 
mm. issues alone. And um, we do provide to our members um, support and capacity development if needed uh, around a whole range of clinical governance to um, governance in general, uh, supports, financial supports, legal advice or supports if they needed. Um, so we do a lot of that work. And um, I just want to ask now if you can describe in broad terms Vacho's interaction with the child protection system. Vacho's interaction with the child protection system is limited. We are not an expert body in child protection. There are other Aboriginal organisations who provide that expertise. But what Vacho is... Um, what our focus wants to be is to how do we change the system? How do we focus on uh, and listening to the evidence prior to my evidence now, um, there's a lot of focus on the children once they're in care. And so it should be, but my focus as VATJO and what our members should be focusing on, how do we prevent our children going into care? How do we strengthen our families? We don't do a lot of that. And that's where it needs greater focus from not only the service provision, but also government resources to allow that. And so from, from that perspective and with those that interaction in mind, uh, is it possible for Vacho to to um, make any observation as to how well the child protection system in Victoria services the Aboriginal community? Yeah. Well, I think the numbers speak for itself, really. I mean, uh, I think we've got about 18 plus in Victoria alone, 18,000, sorry, not 18, 18,000, I better make that clear, 18,000 plus Aboriginal kids in Victoria in out-of-home care, um, and it's growing. Um, and I remember when Andrew Giacomos here in the state of Victoria became the first treaty commissioner for Aboriginal children. Um, and he set up, and it was mentioned in the previous evidence, he set up um, Task Force 1000. Um, and the reason why it's called Task Force 1000 is that there was 1000 kids in care at that time. 1,000 Aboriginal kids in care at that time. So how many children have we got in out-of-home care now? We're not making any difference to stopping our kids going into care. The current system, as, as the previous um, um, uh, Muriel, Muriel was talking about, the system's not right, and she's so spot on. The system isn't right. Uh, and I know the government and with um, other Aboriginal organisations, they talk a lot about and put up on a pedestal Section 18. And Section 18 is about transferring the decision making to Aboriginal communities. Uh, and that, I'm, not knocking that, not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's not the only thing we should focus on. Because if I was the CEO of one of those organisations, I wouldn't want that responsibility with a current system that's not doing right by our children. Um, we've got to also focus on changing the system, regardless of who makes those decisions, to remove a child from a family or a community. Regardless of who makes those decisions, we need to focus on changing a system that hurts us more than it protects us. Bacho also has some interaction with the criminal justice system. Um, you've, you've nodded, yes? Yep. Um, from, from Vacho's perspective again, uh, how fairly or appropriately does the criminal justice system deal with Aboriginal people or service Aboriginal people in the Aboriginal community? And we all know that 
our children going into out-of-home care usually means those children, when they become adults, are going to go into the adult criminal system. So that's pretty well documented. I don't need to quote those statistics. Um, um, so the current correctional services does not meet our needs. As, as, as human beings, it does not meet our needs. It doesn't even meet the needs of non-Aboriginal people, let alone our own people. I believe the system is riddled with racism. The system focuses on punishment and not rehabilitation. And the system needs to change. Alone just this year, in 2022, We had five Aboriginal people die in custody in Victoria. Five Aboriginal people die in custody because they committed a crime of poverty. That's got to stop. Veronica Nelson, and I'll mention one of those deaths, Veronica died in 2020. A young Aboriginal woman. And her only crime is poverty. She got picked up for shoplifting. She was denied bail for shoplifting. She was denied bail twice for shoplifting. So she went to Dame Phyllis. And she died. I'm sorry. We can, we can have a break for no, a moment. No, it's okay. I'll, I'll calm down. She died because she was poor, because she couldn't get a job, because she was a black fella. And the system needs to change to stop that. And Veronica is only one person. And I know every Aboriginal person in this hearing knows these are not just statistics. These are our families. I knew Veronica. She lived just down the road here. In Collingwood. These are our families, these are our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, our uncles, our aunties. So they are not just statistics, it's real and it hurts a community. I remember just recently I gave a speech, I can't remember where, and I spoke about Oh, sorry, it was when, and I don't really want to bring this issue up, it was when the Queen passed away. And um, we talked about sorry business in our communities, our flags. If you look at our organisations right around this country, our flags are flying at half-mast 24-7. That's the trauma our people feel. So the system is not right. It is, comes from a racist, punitive approach. When I was the Treaty Commissioner, I went into every prison because I believed our people who were incarcerated had the right to vote in the elections of the First People's Assembly. But our brothers and our sisters who were in there at the time wanted to talk about a lot more than just voting. <laughs> the fact that they couldn't, the fact that they said, you know what, are we allowed to vote in these elections, told me a story. That they were, they felt valued. And they felt they were important also. So I saw a lot 
of hurts. I saw a lot of wrongs that are committed in the name of correctional services and not just about the five deaths that happened just this year alone of our people here in Victoria. Um, you know, the health services in prisons. I'm not sure how many people realise that Victoria is the only state that contracts private providers, health providers, to provide health services to the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. And that's our people in prison. We provide, we subcontract, the government contracts private providers. And that should not happen. Every person in prison deserves the right to access a public health model approach, not a private provider who is more concerned about this, sorry, I don't know whether you can see that, <laughs> then better health outcomes. That's got to change. We need a public health model provided to our people in prison right across this state. And for our own people, Aboriginal people in prisons. We actually need Aboriginal community controlled health services contracted to provide that. And I will probably, and I know the, the Commission's already aware of it, but there's a model that already exists in Canberra, in the ACT, Wenunga Aboriginal Health Centre which is an Aboriginal community controlled health organisation, who were contracted by the ACT government to deliver health services to Aboriginal people in those prisons up there. And it works. And that's something that you say could be um, done in Victoria? Ah, oh, no doubt about it. Yes. I, I just want to take you back to something that you said earlier. Um, you covered a little bit of territory. Um, one of the comments that you made is that the system is racist. Um, and I, I give you the... Uh, I ask whether you have any views about um, where that racism... Uh, how that racism uh, plays out and where it stems from. I might answer where it stems from first. I think it's, well, it might be obvious to me and the rest of the Aboriginal communities, it might not be obvious to the general populations, but it comes from the uh, colonisation, invasion, whichever way you want to call it, that happened in this country. That's where it comes from. Just recently I was reading a um, book um, and it was published by uh, a couple of Aboriginal women and it was called um, Letters from Victorian Aboriginal Women uh, between 18-something and 1926. And those letters prove the racism, you, you know, the, the, the controlling racism where you need permission to leave a mission the, um, the massacres that were committed on our people, the uh, forced removal of our people um, from their traditional countries. That's all documented. That's not myth or oral histories. It's all publicly documented. Um, that's where the racism comes from. It stems from the very early uh, colonial settlements. Um, and, um, and it still continues today. It still impacts on us as a peoples today. And how it manifests that I see in prisons is the, um, and I got this through my role as the Treaty Commissioner, to a degree, mm. um, you know, speaking to Aboriginal people employed in those prisons, speaking to Aboriginal prisoners themselves, the stories that they've told me about the acts of racism, calling them black dogs, 
um, um, to their face um, and there was one incident where um, a uh, staff member told me that one of the Aboriginal inmates applied for sorry business leave, low security prison, um, and because the script, sorry, because the correctional officers, it was a really nearly said it there, didn't I? <laughs> because of the correctional correctional officers' um, racist attitudes, they didn't want to process that. They left that up to the Aboriginal liaison officer. Um, the terminology, so basically that person didn't get to go to the funeral that that person needed to go to because um, because the paperwork wasn't put through on time and the way it should uh, and that was their job to do it. Because it was a black person, they said, no, that's not my role, that's your role. So that's what I mean by that. The other, the, the, the language that some prisoners have told me that they use with them, you know, coons, abos. And just their attitude. And so those um, acts of racism, are they things that from your... Are you able to say whether they're things that people are experiencing rarely or they're commonplace and every day? Can I say I think institutionalised racism is an everyday event? And institutionalised racism, uh, do you say that in the agencies that we're looking at in this um, part of the, the uh, um, Truth-Telling Commission, um, are, are those institutions the types... Are they institutions that have uh, or suffer from institutional racism? Um, Tony, I don't understand the question, but what I might do, if it's okay with you, if I haven't answered it, tell me. Um, some of the problems that I see within correctional services when it comes to our people um, are there, whether it's racism or whether it's just I don't care or whether it's a, um, a, a mentality that uh, they're there just to uphold the law uh, and punish um, um, some of the solutions to some of that, I believe, is having very strong, strong training ground for correctional officers. Um, in some parts of the country and in some parts of the world, a correctional officer has to undertake two years of training uh, because it's not just keeping law and order. It is about rehabilitation. Here in Victoria, it's eight weeks and it's all about law and order. Um, so I believe there needs to be, for the correctional system, there needs to be good ongoing cultural safety training at all levels of the correctional system um, to address that racism. Yeah, and do you say the same thing about the, uh, the Department uh, of Families in relation to child protection? Uh, or... In, in relation to child protection, I don't know whether I'm um, expert enough to, to say yes or no on that, but what I believe should be happening in relation to children in out-of-home <coughs> care is apart from the preventative, apart from governments focusing also on stopping the kids from going into care and our services focusing on stopping our kids from going into out-of-home care the focus should be once the kid, if they if they are in care and once they're in care, then the focus should be how do we grow that child to become culturally strong in their identity, in their community and know where they're from. An elder once gave me a good talking to about 25, no, 20 years ago. She's still alive today and her name is Arnie Melva Johnson. And she said to me, she said, Jill, if we do not grow our burais strong in culture, they will not be able to face what the world's going to bring to them. So my belief is that our kids, whether they're in care or whether they're in out-of-home care or whether they're in home care, 
or should be grown strong in culture? That's the, that's the answer. That's the tickets. And that healing, not just a clinical model of people talk about trauma-informed care. We need more of it. But we also need Aboriginal healing as part of that care. Continuing on from that point about Aboriginal healing, the submission makes the point that with respect to child protection and criminal justice, both systems, that the structures in those systems is punitive dominant and siloed. Can you just explain for the commissioners what you mean by punitive dominant and siloed? In the correctional system? Yes. Yes. Um, basically, it's my belief that correctional officers, um, their training is, and it's only eight weeks, but it's focused on keeping law and order within the prison. Uh, the focus still has to do that, by the way, to a degree, but I believe the focus should change to a, rehab a re rehabilitation model. That's where the focus should go. Um, so... Training for correctional staff should be around the rehabilitation on top of keeping law and order. Uh, for example, there's a, um, what I mean by that, and is that somewhere in Spain, I can't remember where, but I remember reading, there's a, a youth, a youth, um, a, a, a youth um, correctional facility the main employers of that facility, and there's no walls and there's no bars and it's youth, um, but the, the people that they employ to work in that facility, so it's a youth detention centre, uh, with no bars, um, are mainly social workers and educators for young people. Um, that's at no bars and that makes a safe, nurturing environment for children, whether they're in care or out of home care, but that's what I believe should happen. It should, the correctional services needs to take a focus more around rehabilitation. Otherwise, we will be building more prisons. And what do you say as to the, uh, whether corrections uh, are siloed in the way they do their work? That's a, that's a, it's a bit harder to answer that, um, but they are siloed. Um, there's a whole rain, raft of, um, raft of um, strategies that uh, government need to undertake, and i just got to be careful. Um, but I would point to the commission, the Uruk Commission, to actually seek government's um, approval, I don't know whether you need approval, commissioners, but if you do, um, but uh, over the last 18 months I've been involved in the review of the culture of corrections services here in Victoria. That report was handed to the government on the 1st of December this year, so just last week, was it, or this week? Anyway, just recently. Um, and in that review highlights all the issues um, that we found through that review. It also highlights and recommends a number of solutions. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage your Rook to use its powers and access a copy of that report. Thank you. I won't press you further on that point then. Uh, in, your, in, in the uh, VACHO written submissions, um, there's a recommendation that the Victorian government should increase the proportion of funding given to ACOs who provide child and family support services. Um, so what do you mean by, by that submission? Basically our thinking is, and I spoke about it earlier, the big focus and even the Premier this morning came out and announced that he will be... Um, Overall, overhauling the uh, child protection system. I don't know what that means or what it looks like. Um, but basically my view is, and Vacho's view is that 
Um, we still need to look at how do we stop our children from going into out-of-home care? How do we stop our children from going into youth detention centres? That's what we've got to look at. Otherwise, we'll be here in another 20 years and the numbers would have doubled if we don't do that. Um, and we already have a service system out there that can play a big role in this prevention space. We have um, 26 or 24 Aboriginal organisations that deliver services to their communities. They deliver the wraparound services that I spoke about earlier. They deliver to address the social determinants of health. But what they don't get funded for is to do a lot of that prevention work. And that's what Vacho's calling for. The same amount of investment, if not more, that we put into the tertiary end of the child protection system should go into the prevention end. And we don't have to recreate a whole service system. We have it there already. So I think the focus when it comes to child protection is not about who's going to become Section 8E, whether it's my responsibility as a CEO of one of those organisations to actually make a decision whether I'm going to take the children away. It's about how do we stop that decision being made. That's the focus that we should now look at. Because we're, how long have we been in this space when it comes to child protection? The numbers haven't declined. So whatever we're doing, it's not working. And we've got to stop it. So I believe the Aboriginal organisations that are sprinkled throughout Victoria, some of them get some funding to look at um, I don't know, family reunification or to develop, um, what do you call them, the, um, the uh, cultural plans for children out of home care. Uh, some of them do that sort of work, but it's not enough. And the resources are pittance when it looks at prevention. We need prevention and early intervention into Aboriginal children and families. Thank you. Uh, following on from that answer, um, is there? Uh, uh, um, your, sorry, your submission uh, refers to an increase in resourcing uh, of particular preventative measures, such as residential alcohol and drug detox services and other types of services. Um, can you just? Uh, uh, say something as to the importance of um, targeting those particular areas. What, what's so important about additional funding for the residential sector? Um, one of the biggest issues when it comes to drug and alcohol uh, in our communities today is access to um, detox and rehab. It's a humongous issue. Um, and when you look at the amount of need that's there within our community, uh, we can't meet that need. To get into a detox facility, you could be waiting for months. And by that time, Jill Gallagher says, oh, no, bugger that for a joke. I'm going to go and have another drink. Mm -hmm. So, and I remember about two years ago, 18 months ago, state government invited Vacho to a meeting to talk about $40 million. And I'm making a point here. $40 million and it came out of the drug and alcohol space. Uh, and they asked Vacho to the table, well, what do you reckon we should do with this $40 million? Um, and we already knew what they needed to do with their $40 million. Um, um, but they came with a preconceived a decision that was already made that they already knew what they're going to do with their $40 million. Uh, and one of... Two, three areas in Victoria, um, Gippsland, Gunai Kurnai country, um, the Western Districts, um, raised issues with Vacho that they're struggling to get their people into rehab, well, detox first and then rehab. 
um, and it's not there. It's just not there. So our people have fallen through those cracks. And so that affects families. And it affects whether, you know, if you've got mum and dad who might have drug and alcohol issues, eventually, if that's not dealt with, then we'll probably end up in child protection or in the uh, correctional services. So having access to um, those uh, detox and rehab facilities is vital. It's vital to help that prevention. I'll just take you to another recommendation from uh, the VACHO submission, um, and that is that the Victorian government should, should mandate cultural safety training for all publicly funded mainstream services within the child protection and criminal justice services systems and that this training is provided by an external Aboriginal organisation. Um, OK. I can talk to that because um, this is one of my passions and I've been at Vacho for those in the room who know me. I've been at Vacho for 22 of the 25 years it existed. And, um, and for years we've been advocating to government at many levels that mainstream services, the big hospitals that we have sprinkled throughout Victoria, they need to be culturally safe. The system needs to change to not discriminate against people, our people in hospital. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. And this happened this year, 2022, and I won't mention names or which hospitals. But there was a young Aboriginal man, when I say young, he's probably 30, 40, to me that's young, but uh, a young Aboriginal man um, entered a hospital, major hospital, and he was quite ill and his treatment was really bad. And to the point that security marched him up to his ward in front of public ward, public hospital, marched him up to his bed, body searched him, searched his belongings in the drawer looking for drugs. He's another person that I know quite well. He got out of hospital and he rang me. He rang me and he said, Sis, they do not de deserve to fly our flag. I said, Why? He said, This is what they done to me. And all I was doing was having a cigarette in the courtyard. He died four days after being released from that hospital, being treated like a criminal in a public hospital system. That's one horrific story. There are many more. And over recent years, governments have got very good at making organisations, black and white, safe, in the rainbow tick. VATCHO as an organisation, we receive government funding, we receive government health funding, and if we want to continue to receive that funding, we have to be rainbow tick accredited. But it's not the same requirement to be culturally safe for our people. And how important is it that that training be provided by an external Aboriginal organisation? It is important to keep that independence. Um, and I think it's important that um, uh, that, that um, it's not just Jill Gallagher going in and telling her story to a bunch of GPs or a bunch of administrations within the health system. It's, it's about how do we change that system 
where you don't discriminate with Aboriginal people. Um, so it's important to have that independence. What some hospitals have done over the years has got their Aboriginal staff on top of everything else to provide that culturally safe training. <laughs> That's not good enough. And it has to be to a set of standards, not just Army Jill coming in and telling her story. It has to be a set of standards that they're held accountable for and it's doable and it can be done. Is it something that needs to be maintained or is it a sort of once a, every couple of years type of arrangement? I think it could be something like, you know how the, um, well, the rainbow tick, um, that's, that's accredited and that's maintained, but also, what, is it, what do you call them, reconciliation action plans, they, organisations who have done their, you know, and there's advanced action plans. I forget the, I forget the uh, actual wording of what it is, but that's maintained uh, and they have to meet a set of standards. So cultural safety training is not just about making that system or the people who work in that system aware. It's about how do we change that system. There's a further recommendation in the VACHO submission that the Victorian government should ensure that ACOs, Aboriginal community controlled organisations, are involved throughout all stages within child protection and criminal justice systems, ensuring that uh, Aboriginal people have access to culturally safe, holistic services that maintain a strong connection to their culture, kinship and community. Can you just explain what that recommendation is about? That's basically trying to um, uh, basically say that we already have an Aboriginal service system there um, that does what it can. What it does what it can uh, with the limited limited resources it has. Um, but if if there was a refocus. Well, maybe not refocus is the right word. Maybe if there was an additional focus in the child protection system around preventing our kids going into care, then I believe the service system that's most appropriate to deliver those preventative services are the service system that you currently got out there. Out there and that's the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisations. From a, a health perspective, though, once they're in the system, it, is the maintenance of connection with their culture and their community important for their health and wellbeing? Very much so. Uh, it's imperative, actually. And the best organisations to assist with that are Aboriginal Community Controlled? Yes. Now, whether that be... Um, the current service system in partnership with the traditional owner organisations, um, that, that could, because they need to play a role in, in that area. Uh, I mean, we all, as Aboriginal people, should be playing a role in making sure our children grow strong in culture. Um, I saw a slogan, uh, I think it was from the Canadian First Peoples when I went over there for the Healing the Spirit Conference. They had a slogan on a T-shirt. And it basically said it takes a community to raise a child. And I've never forgotten that. It's not just in the child protection system. It shouldn't just be VACA. It shouldn't just be VACA's outreach. It should be the whole service system that raises that child. And the Victorian Aboriginal Community Controlled organis Health Organisation play a vital role in that. And so do the traditional owner groups. Uh, and I take it... The, the, the traditional owner groups have a role because it, they connect people to country? Connect people to culture, exactly right, and maintain that connection. Is, uh, is there also uh, a role for Aboriginal community controlled organisations in um, assisting people to exit child protection and, and criminal justice systems? Oh, there certainly is. 
Um, and how might they do that? Uh, for, I'll, I'll deal with the child, uh, not the child, uh, the uh, correction, adult correctional system uh, service. I remember many years ago when um, it would be about, I don't know, 15 years ago, and the then consultant who won the bid to provide health services into prisons here in Victoria, their name, their company name was Pacific Shore Health, right? Pacific Shore Health is an um, American company, I think, from memory. They approached Vacho and basically said, we'd love to have a meeting um, to see how we can provide culturally safe health services to um, um, Aboriginal prisoners um, because we've got the, uh, we've got the uh, gig now, we've got the contract. And I said, well, that's fantastic. That's amazing. But, of course, it was all for nothing. Oh, we don't have any funding for that. That's, that's no, no, no. We, we, you know, the health services sh should provide that free of charge. And the health services can provide an Aboriginal health worker. One Aboriginal health worker is not going to make a difference in a big way. That's not the answer. The answer is, and that's not just health services, by the way. I mean, could you imagine having, say, um, VARs, say, for example? I'm only using them as an example. Um, VARs having a contract to provide health services into some prisons here in Melbourne. And can you imagine at the same time they're also contracted to look at uh, exiting the correctional system or the services as an Aboriginal person. Um, uh, so they would be involved in the pre-planning if someone's due to be released and they'd be involved in providing the wraparound supports that may be needed um, in relation to uh, an Aboriginal person coming out of prison. At the moment, nothing like that exists. Never has. We've advocated for over 25 years. Well, a lot of people before me have advocated for the past 40 years. Um, but it hasn't happened. So you can imagine a black fella getting out, say, remand here in Melbourne, uh, and they've got no supports attached to their, to their release. They've got nowhere to live. They haven't got a job. How are they going to live on the streets? But they, they, in, in, if VARS was contracted to provide not only health services but also the support services once being released, that's that wraparound service. That would be amazing. Um, that's what I mean by that. So whether that could work in the correctional system, uh, sorry, the uh, child protection system or not, I don't know, but I think it's worth having a go yes. because nothing else is working. Yes. Now, um, the, the final uh, recommendation and the summary of recommendations that your that the VACHO submission uh, refers to is, is in relation to the creation by the Victorian Government of a social and affordi affordable housing contribution um, and some amendment to the Plan Planning and Environment Act to give councils greater autonomy to implement local versions of such a scheme. It, is it suggested that there be support for more social and uh, affordable housing for Aboriginal community members? Oh, that's what I'm suggesting, yes. And basically we know that the, with the, uh, the one and only um, Aboriginal organisation and that's the, um, oh, the Victorian Aboriginal Housing Board, they have housing stock that they rent out, but there's big waiting lists still. We've still got a lot of our people living rough um, and um, we need to look at how we can address that. If there's a waiting list with the Victorian Aboriginal Housing Board, um, and I know a lot of our members, I can't remember the figure, but a lot of our members also have their own housing stock that they rent out to their Aboriginal community, wherever they're from, you know, in that area, but there's waiting lists for there too. Um, so there is accommodation shortage. Um, there should be accommodation for our mob when they get out of prison and not just for one week or two weeks and not just a motel. Uh, sh we need to look at how do we address homelessness when our mob get out of prison. And uh, is there a real, uh, 
I take it from what you've said that there's a real affordability issue yes. if there's not if it's not government subsidised in some way. Very much so, uh, Tony. I mean, one of the biggest problems when the when the Vacho members. I don't know how many people remember the old chip housing that the Commonwealth administered. Um, and then when the Commonwealth said, look, we're going to give you mob, you can keep those houses, that's okay, um, but we're not going to build up your capability or sustainability to be able to manage that and make it sustainable. You can't make it sustainable when you're leasing to people who live in well under that poverty line. You can't charge full market rent. So that's the dilemma, and we need to explore that. How do we how do we address that? Having secure and stable housing is is one of the um, one of the factors considered in in as a social determinant of health. Yes. And you've the the submission speaks about the social determinants of health as being a, a measure by which. And the health of a community and the individuals within the community can be measured. And um, how does it? Re how does the? Um, how do those social determinants then relate to the criminal justice system and uh, um, people's participation or, or being caught up in the criminal justice system? Well, I mean, when you when you look at most of our mob, what they're in prison for, it all boils down to poverty. There is still a lot of poverty in our communities. Um, and just look at that again. So on page three of the submission. Yeah. So basically my sum – and I'm on page three, I think oh – no, I'm not, I'm on page ten. Uh, but basically, the, you know, on page ten of the submission, we, we quote, this year 70% of Aboriginal people – who have been in contact with the criminal justice system have been charged with non-violent crimes. Now, that's 70 per cent of our mob who are currently in prison are charged with non-violent crimes. And that comes back just to sheer poverty. Yes. And not all our people actually want to... You know, I mean, I think the Curry Courts is a, is a great initiative, by the way. But not everyone wants to plead guilty because that's the only way you can go through the Curry Courts is plead guilty. And if you're not guilty but you want a fair go, <laughs> what options have you got? So from your perspective, people who... Um plead not guilty but are nevertheless found guilty should still be able to go to the Curry Court for the wraparound support yes. services. Yes, very much so. One moment. Hey, you're right. I need a bit of a breather anyway. Take a break. Take a break. Would you like a break? Would you like to take a break? I'm, I'm, I'm okay, but if you guys need a break, I'm... <laughs> I, I'm just... I'm considering whether there are other matters that we need to deal with before we go into um, the restricted evidence, that's all. If I might have a moment. Yeah. Your, the Vacho submissions also make some comment about um, the amendments to the Bail Act in 2017 and 2018, uh, which uh, has the effect of reversing the onus uh, for those charged with an indictable offence. Are you able to expand on that at all? Yeah. Okay. Um
Look, I don't think I'm equipped enough or qualified enough to fully expand, but basically what we're asking for there is, um, you know, the Victorian government should remove the amendments that were made back in 17, 18, uh, which expands those required to prove reverse onus tests for those charged with indictable offences. But basically what it's what we're trying to say is that not a lot of our mob find it easy to navigate that system. It's really hard. I don't know whether you've ever... Oh, sorry. Um, I've navigated that system uh, as a younger woman. It is really scary. It's complicated. And when you look at all that's happened to our people um, since colonisation, since most of our mob were incarcerated anyways back then on missions... Um, um, this system is alien to them and scary, so it's really hard to navigate that. And basically that's what we're saying, Tony. Uh, there's another matter that's raised in your submissions, and that is the access to Medicare by, um, by inmates within the correctional system. Can you just explain what the issue is there? So to me, whether if you go into prison, you're still a human being, um, and prisons prisoners cannot access Medicare. Medicare is a Commonwealth government um, thing. Um, that they that's their ownership, that's their program, uh, and Medicare is a great thing, by the way. I'm not knocking it, but Aboriginal, uh, sorry. Not just Aboriginal, all prisoners should be able to have access to Medicare, which gives them broader access to a whole range of services that deal with the social determinants of health. Mental health, um, even, you know, if a GP for me, if I need to go and I can't afford a psychiatrist, let alone find one, um, a GP for me, through the Medicare rebate, can give me five visits to a psychiatrist or a counsellor Free of charge. Yes. Whereas people in prison can't access that. Yes. Um, and so that that um, obviously affects their ability to obtain the necessary medical services. Yes. Um, and um, uh, have you had any experience of of um, Prisoners being denied access to medical services as a as a punitive response from yes. correctional officers. Can you just explain about that? Um, so basically, I've been um, I've been told through my treaty commissioner role that um, in prison it's really hard to get access to see a doctor. Really is for anyone, black or white. Um, they're very few and far between. That's because they're private providers, but they're very few, far between. Um, and um, a couple of Aboriginal women prisoners have told me when I was the Treaty Commissioner that basically that, can, that usually can be held uh, a correctional officer would withhold them access to that medical appointment that they've made um, as a punitive measure to keep them in control or punish them. And, and um, does the uh, lack of uh, health services in the correctional system also mean that people are, uh, are managed in a different way if they are unwell? Very much so. Mm. Um, and one of the, um, and this one I think is still in the coroner's office, one of the deaths that I spoke about earlier, uh, and I won't mention names, when he went into prison, he was a very fit young man. He died obese. Um, and not having a lot of access to health services according to uh, some preliminary findings. 
And is, is, have you ha had some experience of people uh, with mental health issues? Um, Very much so. Uh, access to mental health is almost non-existent. Um, same, some of the women have told me that there was one woman in particular uh, where she uh, suffered with depression and she was in a low security prison in Victoria and um, they wouldn't let her have any medication for that depression and they basically said to her if she doesn't fall into line, uh, they will send her back to Dame Phyllis and she can get treated there for mental health. But it's my understanding the treatment at Dame Phyllis is a padded cell with a mattress on the floor and something to go to the toilet in. And that's it. So n not a toilet? Sorry? You, not a, there's not a toilet to go to the... the to, to well, there's something in there, yeah. Yeah, they can go to the toilet. That's not the point that I'm making. The point that I'm making in, they don't get access to mental health clinicians. Um, Readily. So, so what's the result then if people know that the the response from correctional services is one which is substandard, what do people do about their mental health issues? Do you, I'm, I'm, if you don't know the answer... I don't know the answer. No. Um, we get into trouble mm. internally um, and then go into isolation because they got into trouble because of their mental health issues? I'm assuming that. Thank you. Um, I'm about to ask the commissioners to go into a restricted uh, evidence session. I'm, I'll just give you the opportunity to na now to add anything further you'd like to add uh, in uh, open uh, session, uh, which will be uh, continue to be streamed live. Is there anything else you'd like to say? I think I just want to basically re-emphasise the importance of... Um, prevention and early intervention. Um, you know, governments have got to start, and including us as our communities, we need to see that that's, that's the key. That's the key from stopping our people from going into correctional services. It's also the key to stop our kids from going into out-of-home care. We've got to look at how we make our family strong, and that's that prevention, early intervention, and not a lot of weight... All resources are equally applied to that as opposed to the tertiary end. So Thank you. I, I'm, I might uh, now uh, ask the commissioners if they, they have any questions uh, for, for you before we go into a uh, restricted session. I've got just one. I'm, I'm really struck by your talking of the, the sort of culturally safe tick and organisations and I've been to some of those conferences in Canada and one of those that has already always stuck with me and I'm wondering if you see evidence of it here. They talked, the First Nations people there from the health scene talked about racism grooming within the health sector where doctors and things like here would come from overseas because we didn't have enough supply and yet were very quickly taught that when a First Nations person comes in unresponsive responsive, the first thing you suspect is that they're a drunk or that they've had drug overdoses. Can I tell you a personal story that will answer that and highlight what you're trying to say? Mm. A lot of Aboriginal people in this room, I can see one, Robbie Thorpe, who, who, who would know this person that I'm about to talk about, and I don't have a problem mentioning his name. He's now passed and he's my blood uncle. Uh, and that's Uncle Albert George Jackson. Uncle Albert is my mum's brother, but he grew up in out-of-home care. He was taken away the day he was born on a mission. He 
he when he when he got out, he reconnected. He uh, found the love of his life, which is which was Uncle Lloyd e. Clark, um, and they lived together for many many years. They were well known characters in Fitzroy, and uh, to my knowledge, they were the first uh, gay couple that came out in the uh, uh, Melbourne community, um, and they were very staunch. Uncle Albert, unbeknownst to us and to, hi to himself and his family, had Huntington's disease. Mm. And for those who don't know what Huntington's disease is, it is uh, usually hereditary and it affects your capacity to walk properly. You can't control your limbs and eventually your mind uh, goes. Uncle Albert George Jackson died of Huntington's. But prior to his death, he lived in the Collingwood High Rise, which you see from these windows. And um, he broke his hip falling down the stairs one day. Uh, and this is early in the morning. And he got taken by ambulance to St Vincent's Hospital. And I met the ambulance there and um, because it also, Huntington's, slurs your language, how you talk. He couldn't talk properly. And for those who didn't know him would think he was charged, but he wasn't. Anyways, he ended up in um, St Vincent's emergency and the doctor said to him, Albert, he said, what did you have for breakfast? And Uncle Albert, in his slurred language, said Wheaties. But the doctor assumed he said whiskey. And if I wasn't there to interpret that, I said to the treating doctor, I said, no, he's not drunk. He had Wheaties for breakfast, not whiskey. So that prompted them then to do further investigations because he couldn't hardly walk. And it turned out he was diagnosed with Huntington's. So yes, that preconceived conception of Aboriginal people being lazy and drunk and no hopers and don't want to work still exists in our systems. Um, only Jill. So the, um, I'm going to ask you, and you might not be informed to, to add this, but it's about the public drunkenness issue. So Minister Gabrielle Williams gave evidence to us um, last year, or really last year? This year. This year. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. Not sure I am. Um, and they remain committed to the abolition of public drunkenness offences, but it was delayed partly to COVID. And we know that they're talking about health response to that. So given that was back in May and given the commitment was made after the death in custody of Arnie Tanya Day in 2020, what would you say about the government sitting on this reform? Can I say, when I came back from the treaty gig, can I say, <laughs> back to Vacho, it was in the height of COVID um, and um, um, I wasn't aware that the, the government, through the Justice Department, was embarking on decriminalising public drunkenness. But I thought it was good when I found out. So I thought, no, this is fantastic. So the Department of Justice drove that agenda to decriminalise public drunkenness. And they had a plan. And I think it was supposed to go to Parliament December this year. Uh, it's now been delayed till next year or something. Anyways. Um, um, and then when we all agreed, the Department agreed that it's going to be decriminalised, but what do we do once it is decriminalised? If we have still our people who are affected by um, alcohol, what do we do? What is there a service system there that needs to be established and set up? Uh, and I just think, look, I think COVID did impact on their decision to pause it. But I know Vacho's advocacy was around, well, we need to put some interim arrangements. We need to make sure... It's the police aren't the first responders. Whether it's decriminalised or not. So we can't, if we, if, 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 if we don't want to repeat 
of Aunty Tanya Day. Um, so therefore, our advocacy to government has been, well, what interim measures can we put in place so the police are not the first responders? And I believe it could be and should be, uh, for our people anyways, um, night patrols. Uh, where a lot of support can be provided to people. It doesn't have to cost the government $200 million recurrently to make sure it's a big hospital response. Um, but I was disappointed that um, it didn't go to Parliament um, this year for it to be decriminalised and it has been delayed. So I think the struggle now is what do we put in place in the interim? Uh, you know, if our because we don't want our people die, and if the police are going to pick them up and charge them with public drunkenness, how do we put little interim things in place? I think night patrols. I think vows should be resourced uh, heavily to be able to um, meet that demand when when our mob are picked up by the police. Um, uh, who's going to check on them in the cells? Uh, should there be a health, um, sorry, a health professional alongside the police? There's all those questions, but nothing's been decided upon. Can I, can I just add to that that Uncle Kevin Coombs gave evidence of a program that he had quite a while ago that worked really well. Um, so I'd just like to bring that to light as well, mm. that, that he brought that up in his, his ah, evidence. Very good. So there, there's previously been, but it was again only funding. Yeah. Support funding. So. Yeah. Thank you, Annie Jules. Oh, thank thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, you referred to the rainbow tick um, as a, a quality control measure uh, and uh, cultural lack of cultural awareness right through to institutionalised racism is a serious problem on your evidence, uh, which uh, leads to questions about how to change that structurally across the board. Uh, and uh, one way that standards are achieved in, uh, in both the public and the private sector is through uh, international standards. Um, the International Standards Association uh, certifies standards for just about everything. Um, uh, examples include uh, asset systems, environmental management systems, uh, risk, safety, energy, um, occupational health and safety, and so on. And these are enshrined in law in very many instances. This building uh, is structurally safe because virtually every item in it uh, is ISO certified and has to be under law. Uh, are you aware of any examples of, uh, of systems like this, either legal or not legal, which would prescribe standards of cultural awareness uh, as... Um, uh, as a way of guaranteeing quality, as it were, a quali the quality of understanding uh, uh, Aboriginal culture and its relevance to the service or yeah. occupation concerned. So basically what you're asking, are there any standards out there that we yes. can point to? Yes. To my knowledge, no, but that's something that FATCHO is st developing a set of standards for the health sector anyways, the health and wellbeing sector, that includes mental health. Um, we are currently exploring what those standards would look like. But what it would need is, now whether that's uh, incorporated into ISO or QUICSA or, or any other accreditation regulator, uh, it needs to be done that. But quite easily government can do it with major hospitals and that's through their funding contracts. Mm -hmm. That's simple to do. All we need to know is what those standards are and how we how we implement those standards, and what do they do if those standards if they breach those standards? For example, I'm not sure how many uh, people in the room, and I can't remember. Was it last year that a major hospital in Melbourne, or might have been the year before, was in the media, all over the news, current affair, everyone about the uh, Aboriginal woman from Shepparton? who was um, turfed out of the hospital late at night, freezing cold, um, and she laid on the concrete unconscious yeah. and no one attended to her. That's in the public arena, by the way. Um, 
Um, so if something like that happened and say, for example, if that hospital had the cultural tick, what do we do? How do we manage those standards? How do we say, well, you no longer have those that tick no more, we're going to take it off you? Um, they're the sorts of things that we've got to, we've got to be... Um, we got to be aware of, and they're the sorts of things that we're working on, is those standards. And whether it could be incorporated into, like, ISO, what is it now, ISO 9000 or whatever, um, yep. or any other regulating accreditation. Yeah. I mean, Jill, can I, can I just... Is that, can I just add, would... Because would, um, we can look into institutions, and I know that Commissioner Walter has spoken about this before, so universities, mm. looking at the standards to do doctors, nursing, social, all those frontline workers, so, so to speak, what would you, what, what would your comments be on, on looking into those areas? Uh, um, I've got a lot of comments looking into <laughs> those areas. I think, I think we need to. Mm -hmm. I mean, main, we, we talk about, we as Aboriginal people, we talk about mainstream services. When I talk about mainstream services, I talk about mainly the major hospitals who play a big role in our lives and has done since they were here. Um, uh, some of it's not, not good, a lot of it's pretty bad and a lot the history with our mob and hospitals is there for everyone to read. But um, accessing hospitals is just as, as daunting as accessing correctional or a, or a, or a uh, court of law system. That's just as is daunting. You need those um, navigators. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, I can sit here all night and tell you some horrific stories of Aboriginal people um, that I have witnessed personally as an Aboriginal woman being in that hospital and witness, and, and by the way, I can go undercover. I cannot identify if I want, mm. uh, and they don't know I'm Aboriginal. But a lot of our people can't mm -hmm. go undercover. Um, they obvious, and there was one Aboriginal woman when I was the Treaty Commissioner, and I actually lodged a, a complaint. But you complain against a hospital, and it goes into the black hole, mm -hmm. uh, and you never hear anything from it, and it's all washed under the carpet. With the support of, I believe, the governments. Um, but um, a lot of atrocities still happen in hospitals today. Uh, and no one looks at them. No one does a review of hospitals with the view of looking at Aboriginal uh, patients, Aboriginal experience of hospitals uh, and uh, in a modern world. So that I, I'm passionate about hospitals being held accountable and we can only do that through a set of standards. And just sorry, just really quickly, most of your recommendations talk about health response to child protection mm. and criminal um, justice. Do the health services get enough money to no. do? Okay. No, the answer is no, definitely not. And I can quote something that VARS, VARS, the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service, they actually, uh, and I, I, I won't say too much because I don't know the level of detail, but they employ, an, and I think one of them are going to be given uh, evidence to this hearing, but they actually employ uh, a lot of good clinicians uh, in VARS, ranging from nurses to doctors to Aboriginal health workers to Aboriginal health practitioners and paediatricians. Um, and there's a couple of paediatricians that work at VARS that have a really strong view about where the system is letting our children down, uh, letting our children down in the protection system. Yep. Uh, and I think that's really important evidence that you guys need to hear and have access to. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Chair, if there are no other questions from the commissioners, there's um, just uh, one matter arising that I, I might ask of the witness before we go into the restricted session. Um, Adi Joel, you, you were asked about the public drunkenness reforms. Uh, your uh, written submissions, the written submissions of Vacho address this issue um, and 
I'm aware that you've spoken about it on other occasions in other places, um, and I just would give you the opportunity for the for the purpose of the public record to uh, to restate Vacho's position with respect to uh, whether the age of uh, minimum age of criminal responsibility ought to be raised and to what age. Yes. Okay. Um, um, in relation to public drunkenness, I think it must be crim decriminalised, um, but there has to be services in place to um, look after our mob in those areas. In relation to criminal age of responsibility in this country, in this state, I think it's appalling that in Victoria it's still 10. Uh, I am aware that the Northern Territory recently increased their age of criminal responsibility to 12. Um, I don't think it's gone far enough. Our push and our advocacy in this state should be to 14. Uh, and that's Vacho's position. Thank you. Um, that concludes the unrestricted evidence, uh, uh, Chair. I would ask that a an order be made, a, a restricted publication order be made pursuant to Section 26 of the Inquiries Act 2014. Um, the orders uh, proposed are that pursuant to Section 26.1 of the Inquiries Act 2014, and having regard to the matters set out in Section 26.2b and e, uh, one, Oral evidence given by Auntie Jill Gallagher AO at the public hearing in relation to those issues expressly deemed to be sensitive in nature not be published, in brackets, to the extent captured in the transcript or video recording, close brackets. And two, a copy of this order is uh, to be published on Uruk's website uh, with the note at one Pursuant to Section 48.1 of the Inquiries Act 2014, Victoria, it is an indictable offence for a person, including a body corporate, to knowingly or recklessly contravene an order of the Commission under Section 26.1. I'd ask that uh, the Commission make that order. I make these orders in the terms sought. Thank you, Chair. Um, we might uh, adjourn for a few moments to allow the... Uh, the live stream to be uh, dealt with. Um, so uh, perhaps five minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.